Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Matt, it's great to finally be able to do one of these in person with you. We've done a lot of these remotely. Uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that you're in Texas for uh, filming a documentary about aging, which is pretty awesome. Um, so when we knew that this was going to happen, we said, well, let's take advantage of you being here and let's let's come up with something that we both talk about so much uh, over email, which I, is to say, I don't <laughs> think a week goes by that we aren't exchanging an email about some aspect of the relationship or the interspace between nutrition and longevity. Uh, does that speak to our ignorance? Does that speak <laughs> to the ubiquity of such content? I don't know. What does that say about yeah, us? Yeah. I mean, I th- I, well, I think, you know, it's an, it's an area that a lot of people are really interested in and, and, um, and it certainly intersects with, uh, popular culture. So, you know, I, I, uh, having been in the aging field for, for a long time, I certainly recognize how complicated that biology is. And I think the biology of nutrition is equally complicated. And, you know, when you get at the interface of those two, um, it's really hard, I think, sometimes to draw definitive conclusions. So a new paper will come out, you know, and and you usually read the papers before I do, and you're like, hey, what do you think about this? And and then, you know, we we throw it back and forth. But I think it's um it's hard sometimes to get to concrete answers. So certainly we'll try to do that today. But I also think, you know, this will be a little bit of a theme that that um there are many things we don't understand yet about optimal nutrition and how that intersects with optimal health span. Yeah. And you and I have spent so much time on the podcast speaking about the molecules, right? The right. molecules, right? Um, of course, our favorite being rapamycin, but but all sorts of them, right? We recently talked about NMN, NR, NAD. We've talked about metformin. And, you know, basically, it's easier almost to ask the questions in the stamp from the standpoint of geroprotective molecules because the intervention is much cleaner. Yeah, absolutely. Like, are you taking this drug? Yes or no. And of course, what's interesting about that, and I think it speaks to what we're going to talk about today, think about the one drug among those that stands out, which is rapamycin. Even within that, just I think yesterday or two days ago, you and me and David Sabatini had a back and forth about timing of the dose you know, frequency within the dosing schedule, the dose itself. I mean, even with a drug, it's still very complicated to say, well, what about during this phase? Because the study I think we were talking about was looking at mice and it was asking the question of early exposure of rapamycin later in life, constant dosing, intermittent dosing. Yep. That's for a drug and we're still struggling to piece it together. Now imagine trying to ask that question of your food. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, we'll obviously talk a lot as well about the animal models and what they can tell us about, you know, what might affect human aging. But the big piece that gets lost with the animal models on top of all that complexity is the environment, right? So, you know, we keep these mice in a well-controlled environment, usually relatively pathogen free, and they live in that same environment their entire life. Now you think about the human experience where our environment is extremely complicated. We're constantly getting bombarded with all sorts of, you know, challenges and and, uh, infectious agents. And our environment changes dramatically throughout our lives. In fact, you know, maybe this is something we want to touch on. A lot of the epidemiological studies on optimal nutrition are from 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? The average human environment is very different today than it was when those studies were done. And how does that potentially change the interaction between nutrition and health outcomes. I, I think it's a really interesting but challenging question to to address to anybody's satisfaction, honestly. Yeah, that's actually a great point. And, and I made a similar point on a totally different topic, which was <clears throat> all of the studies that use uh, that talk about cancer screening are, are very backwards looking by definition, right? Yeah. You have to look at controlled trials that were done in the past, but the technology of radiology is changing so much. You know, radi- radiology is a very, you know, physics based uh, field of medicine. And so when you read a study that talked about, you know, mammography for screening, well, and it, you know, it was a 15 year study, right? So it's a great study. Well, by definition, it was done sort of based on 30 to 20 year old technology yep. that by the time the study has been completed, you have the follow-up data, you write up the paper, it doesn't necessarily represent what's happening today. And and that's that's a huge challenge of evaluating that type of data. Yeah. And in and in people, because we age so slowly, you know, there's really not a lot you can do about that if you want to try to do correlative longitudinal 
studies of aging, right? Because people age so slowly, the people who are in their 70s today were in their 30s 40 years ago. And so the environment that they were in is probably quite different than the environment that 30 year olds are in today. So there's not a great way around that. I think the key is to recognize that limitation and be potentially even more careful about assuming causation from correlation over many decades. Yeah. So as, as a bit of a mea culpa on the topic of nutrition, which is really my least favorite topic, despite the fact that it keeps coming up on this podcast and it's unavoidable, I, as I reflect back on my own understanding of this topic, the strength with which I held convictions over the past more than decade, I, I would say I've I've gone in reverse, right? I have looser and looser convictions as time goes on, yeah. and I view fewer and fewer things with certainty as time goes on. And, <clears throat> you know, when I think about this problem clinically, I have what I would consider to be an incredibly simple framework, which is if I'm looking at a patient, I'm asking a question, are you overnourished or undernourished? Are you under muscled or adequately muscled? And then on, so that's a two by two, right? And then are you metabolically healthy or not? That's sort of my first order question. Now, yeah. one of those spaces doesn't really have too many people in it. The, um, adequately muscled, undernourished, metabolically healthy bucket doesn't, uh, metabolically unhealthy bucket doesn't really exist. So hmm. it's not, these aren't, people aren't uniformly distributed in those buckets, but it's a pretty good way to sort people. And you can't sort someone by looking at them into that bucket, but by looking at them, doing some functional testing, looking at their biomarkers, and that might include also doing things like a DEXA scan where you can actually get some objective data you can pretty quickly figure that out. And the reason we think that's important is it helps us understand, do you need an energy deficit? Do you need an energy right. surplus? What's your protein intake need to be to achieve that in combination with your calorie needs? And, you know, the hardest uh, of those to treat by far is over uh, nutrition, under muscled. And unfortunately, that's a very common phenotype. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of people these days. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that I think as a general approach, first order approach, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that 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 allows you to recognize, right, is that that the optimal strategy is there's no one size fits all, I guess, would be the way I'd say it. Right. Different people are going to have different needs nutritionally and what works really well for one person, you know, may not work at all for another person. And so I think, I think, you know, kind of looking at it at that level, um, allows you to, to, to not have to try to say everybody should be doing X. Right. Um, so I think, I think that, that is pretty similar to the way I think about it. Obviously I don't practice medicine and I, I try not to make recommendations for what people should do, but in my own life, that's generally the way that I try to approach it as well. And I, and I hope I'm doing okay. You haven't tested me yet, so you can't tell me which bucket I'm in, but, but I think I'm doing okay for my age, uh, with my, my nutritional strategies. And the other thing that I sort of have, have realized similar to what, what I think you were saying before is that, you know, it's an ongoing learning process. And so I think it's really important that we be willing to change our beliefs about nutrition and other aspects of health as more data comes in. Um, so I think if you take that strategy, then you can, you can be open to the possibility that what you believed 10 years ago, you know, might not have been exactly right. And maybe we need to, to, to tweak it a little bit. Um, you know, my personal view on nutrition, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I have real trust problems with nutritionists. And I think it, you know, in part it stems from, I remember very vividly when I was, I think I was probably in my early 20s and I, I read, you know, one of these diet guru books and it was sort of the, the sort of the, the, the theme, this was, I'm going to date myself, but this was, you know, early 90s, I guess. Um, the theme back then was, you know, you could eat anything you wanted as long as you cut out the fat, right? You could have this really high, simple carbohydrate diet, just keep it low fat and, you know, you'll be fine. And we now know that's, that's exactly wrong, right? I mean, so I think, you know, I, I can't help but look at a lot of what people, you know, the, 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 what I would put sort of on the, the, the fad diet side, the diet gurus, what they're saying today, how do we know 10 years from now, 
we're not going to look back on that and again be like that just makes no sense. I think some of us today can look at some of what's out there and say, that just makes no sense. But, you know, I think, again, this gets back to the, to what I was saying before. It's not that I, it's not that I would say nutrition science is across the board, low quality. I think they're actually really good scientists doing really good work in this area. It's just a really hard problem. And I, and I do think to some extent, the biology of aging and the biology of nutrition do share that and that they are, these are extremely complicated biological systems that we're, we're trying to understand in the, in the context of sort of this, this changing environment over time, right? And so, so I, don't, I don't blame the scientists. I just think we have to be really careful to recognize what the limitations are and not draw really strong conclusions. Like everybody should eat, you know, a low protein diet, right? That's kind of one of the fads that are out there today. I think that's, that's a mistake to, to, to recommend across the board, you know, nu nutritional strategies for everyone. Um, I guess the last thing, sorry, I, I'm, I'm talking a long time here, but I guess the last thing that, that what you said, you know, makes, makes me think of as well. And I think this is really important because people lose sight of this is, you know, exactly what you said, if you can be, you know, somewhere close to, uh, uh, optimal, nutritional intake, right? We'll just say total calories, regardless of composition, body composition is somewhere close to where it should be. That's, that's a big chunk of what you need to give yourself the best chance of being healthy going forward, right? You don't have to optimize every single thing. Now, I know you're all into optimization and I, and I respect that about you. I think if you can do that, that's great, but you don't have to, to get most of the benefits. And so I think starting from that big picture perspective allows you to get most people most of the way there. And then when they're most of the way there, you can focus on how do we get that last 10, 20, 30%, whatever it is. Actually, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Matt. And, and I would argue, and I do argue now in a very different way from we, where I used to be a few years ago. You know, there are most things in my life where I don't like the 80-20 principle. You know, uh, my good friend, Tim Ferriss, like he's the king of this, right? He's the king of how can I get 80% of the learning with 20% of the time? And I've never seen anybody who can do it like Tim. Like the guy can learn a language in a month. <laughs> he can be 80% proficient in a language in a month, right? Um, I'm the opposite. I'm the guy who loves the tail. I love the asymptote. I love the perfection of something. I would say in nutrition, that is exactly not where my interest lies. <laughs> I agree that you can just get 80% of this right by focusing on, you know, exactly what we've talked about. And the, the details, the complete optimization are not worth it. Yeah. And it's instead better to put that effort into exercise. That's where I think yeah. if you're going to really go down the rabbit hole and put more of your mental energy, more of your time and more of your focus into something, you have far more of an ROI on the exercise front than eking out incremental value on the nutrition front. And I've joked about this before. Other guests on the podcast, Lane Norton and I have had riffs on this back and forth. The people who sit there on Twitter, which I realize is not <laughs> a representative sampling of the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's simply a, an annoying vocal group of people who will waste endless hours debating the finer points of their dietary pet peeves who can't do 10 pull-ups yeah. is amazing. Yeah. I mean, there, there should be a rule that says, <laughs> if you can't deadlift twice your body weight and do 15 pull-ups, you shouldn't be allowed to pontificate endlessly You're not allowed to be about on the Twitter. finer points you, of nutrition. Yeah. Like, you know, we can, we can talk to Elon about that. Maybe that can be a new rule. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, so, so look, I think we've established nutrition matters here. I mean, but I think at the same time, you know, I think David Allison said it once to me. Um, it's amazing how little we know about this subject matter. Mm -hmm. Kind of rehashing what we said. We know that too much and too little are bad. Um, and for most of our existence, we we were worried about the too little problem. The, the yeah. too much problem has become a relatively recent phenomenon. Right. And they're bad in different ways, like acutely, chronically. They, they have different limitations. Um, we know that certain things are toxic, right? Acutely or chronically. Um, not a lot we know. I mean, with definitive clarity, yeah. there's not a lot we know beyond those things. Um, so one thing that seems to be true is, 
at least from the animal literature, caloric restriction seems to reproducibly improve lifespan. And so, so let's, let's kind of talk about how that came to be as an understanding. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this, um, this area of research is actually quite old. So that's a like hundred years. Yeah. Ago. The first experiments were published in the early to mid 1930s, right? Which means they were probably started in the 1920s, right? So almost a hundred years ago, people were going down this, this line of thinking of asking, you know, what is the effect of, um, significant restriction of calories on the aging process in mammals. So the early studies were all done in rats. And actually, if, if I remember correctly, these studies were originally designed from a developmental perspective. So they were really thinking about malnutrition um, and its effects on development. And as a byproduct, made the observation that yes, when you restrict calories in a, in a rat early on in life, they have a smaller body size. Um, uh, but then if you let them live out their entire lives, this is in the laboratory. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, you know, they live 40, 50% longer. So we're talking really significant increases in lifespan. And then the other thing that was appreciated pretty quickly was not only are they living longer, but they seem to be healthier as they're living longer. So, you know, this concept of health span and the period of life that is, you know, spent in good health, free from disease and disability it seemed as if caloric restriction was not only increasing lifespan, but, but also extending health span. So, you know, that led to uh, obviously a, a large body of literature since then studying the effect of caloric restriction in not just rodents, rats and mice, but also all sorts of simpler organisms, invertebrates like fruit flies and C. elegans and yeast. And the common theme seems to be that, again, starting from laboratory conditions, if you restrict nutrients by a whole variety of different, different methods, um, you can increase lifespan and apparently increase health span proportionally, at least proportionally. Um, so there's a lot of nuance there, a lot that we can dive into and to unpack. But I think that's generally the, the take home, right? Is that over and over and over again across, you know, these, the evolutionary distance we're talking about is much, much greater than the evolutionary distance between rodents and humans, right? So, so over a very wide evolutionary distance in pretty much every organism where it's ever been studied, you can find evidence that caloric restriction slows aging. Um, uh, again, there are, there are cases where that didn't happen, where lifespan wasn't extended, where lifespan was shortened. Maybe we want to talk about this at some point, the interaction between genetics and environment and caloric restriction. But in general, that is the, the, the take home message is caloric restriction can slow aging in laboratory animals, pretty much everywhere where it's been studied. Um, the one, I think, question question that some people have is whether that's true in non-human primates and so there were you, yeah so i was just about to say i was gonna say before we get to nia wisconsin yeah which is perhaps the single greatest experiment that's ever been done to test this hypothesis both in terms of its duration level of control and proximity to our genome let's spend a moment on that before we do any things that come up from the rodent studies that are worth talking about? So for example, <laughs> one of the things that I think is always important to point out is there's a very particular death that tends to fall on laboratory mice. They have, you know, if you look at our, the death bars for humans, there's much more heterogeneity. Yeah. But the leading cause is atherosclerosis. Now that's true in the United States. It's true across the globe. So yeah. when you mix in, develop and undeveloped, it doesn't matter. Laboratory mice aren't that way. Right. Well, they die of pretty much one thing and one thing alone. And that is... Actually, it's euthanasia. But I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> cancer, right? Yeah, so, cancer. Yeah. They all die of cancer, right. so, basically. So, so uh, certainly every uh, old mouse at time of death will will have cancer. And again, th because of the way animal studies are done, usually... Um, you have defined endpoints where when a mouse reach that, reaches that endpoint, they have to be euthanized. But the, the expectation is that it, if they hadn't been euthanized, they would have died from the cancer. So I right. think you're absolutely right. Yeah, they, they're not dying from atherosclerotic. That's right. they, when you look at their arteries, right. they're not littered with plaques the way ours are. At least the commonly used inbred mouse strains, that yeah. is definitely true for. There are you know, this is maybe getting in the weeds a little bit, but there are certainly mouse strains that have been designed either transgenically or through selection to develop other pathologies that will shorten their lifespan. But if you let a, a typical 
mouse strain in the lab, live out its natural life, it will have a very high tumor burden at the end of life. And most likely, you know, I, I guess I should know this. I don't know exactly. I'm guessing 80% yeah, of the animals- Yeah, I think it's about 75, 80% yeah, of them. Would, would die from cancer. Yeah. So it's a, it's different from yep. humans in that way. And I actually think this is, you know, this is a legitimate- um, criticism to some extent of the caloric, the interpretation of the caloric restriction literature that is, could it be the case that really what caloric restriction is doing is preventing cancer? And that's why you see these big increases in lifespan. And I think that's really difficult to definitively answer one way or the other. What I would say is, you know, mice do develop functional declines in every tissue and organ as they age very much like people do. So, you know, a person may die from cardiovascular disease, but at the same time, if they're in their eighties, their kidney isn't functioning as well. Their heart isn't functioning as well. Their brain probably isn't functioning as well. That's right. So mice show all of those same declines in function with age and caloric restriction seems to delay, delay or outright declines. prevent those declines as well. So yeah, maybe the lifespan effect is primarily due to cancer, but caloric restriction is having an effect, apparently, on the underlying biological aging process um, in all sorts of, of different ways. And I, and I really like the functional measures. A lot of people in the field these days are, are really enamored with you know, the, the aging clocks, epigenetic clocks, biochemical markers. I think those are all useful and important. But from my perspective, what really gets my attention is if somebody shows that the heart is still functioning like a young heart or the immune system is yeah, still functioning. Yeah, uh, I wasn't planning to go down that rabbit hole, but since you brought it up, um, can you convince me of the utility of the clocks absent the type of data that would actually demonstrate longitudinally their benefit, which to, to my knowledge, we really don't have yet? Yeah. So I, I would say a couple things on that. I think we we need to be precise in what we mean when we talk about the clocks, because there's lots of flavors of clocks, Absolutely, right? Yeah. Most people these days, if you just say aging clock, they, what they really mean are the epigenetic clocks that are showing, you know, the, the characteristic changes in the epigenome, the epigenetic marks that are seen with age. Again, in every, in every organism where it's really been studied, um, you do see these characteristic changes in the epigenome with age. And so I would say one place where their utility is clear, at least to me, is as a chronological measure, right? Mm -hmm. Now you might ask, okay, why would I ever want to, you know, use an epigenetic clock to, to, to tell my chronological age? I know how old I am, right? But forensics, for example, might be a place where that's useful. Their crime has been committed. They want to know with some level of precision how old the, the perpetrator is. You could use an epigenetic clock for that reason. Um, you know, and in, in, in my world, as part of the dog aging project, there are many dogs, you know, that are rescued. An owner might want to know their age. So I think that is a, that is a mm -hmm. real use. And, and clearly the clocks will work for that. I think really what you're asking though is, can I convince you that the epigenetic clocks and potentially other types of clocks are actually measuring biological aging. Correct. Right? And that's a harder, in my mind, that's a harder thing to prove. And personally, I have no interest in convincing you of that because I'm not convinced, right? So I think this is an area where the field is um, in flux a little bit. And there are certainly scientists who I respect a lot in the field who believe, you know, at their core that these epigenetic clocks tell us about biological aging or can be used to tell us about biological aging. And then there are people like me who want to see the proof. And I think the, the proof is really being able to show at an individual level, that could be in a mouse, could be in a person, yeah. could be in a dog. At an individual level, you can predict someone's biological age at some point in their life and with some level of precision, predict what's going to happen in the future. What are their future health outcomes? How are they? How long are they going to live? Nobody has done that yet. What they've done comes close, I guess. So what has been done is to look at longitudinal studies in people where we have samples from people 10, 20, 30 years ago, measure the epigenetic profiles of those people 10, 20, 30 years ago, and ask how well does that correlate with mortality outcomes, for example, in the future? And... They, they do work to some extent. I think people will debate how well they work. Are they any better than other markers you could look at um, in predicting mortality? I think that's unclear, but there is some correlation there. So, you know, again, I think it, it really depends to, to some extent maybe on how skeptical you are. I'm a skeptic by nature and, uh, and I want to actually see the proof. Um, 
I guess the last thing I would th say about this, I'm, I'm, I'm talking mostly about the epigenetic clocks. Um, maybe it's worth talking about other types of clocks that, that people can make. The other thing I want to caution people on though is assuming that the epigenetic clocks are the only important thing about aging. There is again, you know, a small number of um, very vocal and, and uh, popular people in the field who talk as if changing the epigenome is going to change everything about aging. We have no data to support that. Just, there's like, I, I just have to say it, that is not true at this point. We have no data to support it. Um, if, if what we know about the biology of aging is that epigenetic changes are one of, depending on how you categorize things, you know, eight or nine or 10 molecular processes that seem to contribute with, that, that the field has reached consensus on. It's only one of those things. Is it possible? that it, it is sort of in a hierarchy, the most important and drives a lot of those other changes. Yes, that's possible. We don't have any data to support it. So this idea that reversing the epigenome is reversing aging is at best an exaggeration, at worst an outright lie. I mean, it's just not true. How could that be? What, what a set of experiments technology wise would you need to be able to do to even yeah. test that hypothesis say so in, a, in a mouse right we're close yeah. well maybe close I, I guess i should qualify that a little bit um conceptually we're close so there have been these factors called the yamanaka factors that can um, reprogram the epigenome so this has been done in cells mm -hmm. so if you take cells in culture in a laboratory and you passage them many many times you can see changes in the epigenome, yep. just like you might see changes in the epigenome in an animal, in tissues. And you can put these reprogramming factors into the cells and turn them on. Now, there are four Yamanaka factors? There are four Yamanaka factors, and pe but people are trying different, yep. different cocktails, adding some other stuff in, taking some stuff out. But yes, there are the four classic Yamanaka factors. And what those factors do is they basically wipe clean the epigenetic changes that have happened over time. Um, and also what's amazing is that they restore those cells back to a, if you take it far enough, back to a pluripotent state. So essentially you get, you know, virgin new cells that could differentiate into any cell type in the body, right? So this has been known for many years. What is relatively more recent over the last, you know, eight or nine years are people are trying to express these reprogramming factors in an animal. So, so instead of doing it in cells in the laboratory, do it in an animal. And I think the most compelling work um, uh, is work in a premature aging mo model of mice. So it's called a progeroid model um, where they're very short-lived, they're very sick, but these, these reprogramming factors can, you know, extend lifespan by, I don't remember what the exact numbers are, but a significant amount, maybe 40, 50, 50%, wow. which seems like a lot, except you have to recognize these mice live, you know, maybe 25% of the length of a normal mouse, right? Yeah. So they're very sick. So, but, but there are impressive changes that happen that, that are consistent with the idea that you fixed or made something better, okay? So the experiment to do would be to express these reprogramming factors in an old mouse and make that mouse young again, okay? And this is where I think the um, exaggeration, I'll use the nice word, has gotten ahead of the actual data. So what has been done is showing that in one or two, maybe three tissues, you can see an improvement in function. The most impressive, I think, is work from David Sinclair's lab where they, they use this optic degeneration model. Yep. So, so, so uh, degeneration of the eye showed that they could reverse that with these reprogramming factors and then, and then tried to do the same thing in an old mouse. And there was at least, you know, the data was, was mixed, but I think pretty compelling that you could, to some extent, regenerate the optic nerve in an old mouse, okay? So that certainly impressive, I think, um, uh, exciting, but nobody has ever taken an old mouse and, and turned it into a young mouse. And when, so when people start talking about reversing aging, right, that implies that you have taken an old animal or person and to some extent biologically made them young again, that hasn't happened. So what I would say needs to happen to really convince me, there, there are two things. So I would be convinced that, that, that it's, that this is, um, uh, useful, potentially therapeutically and important. I'm actually already convinced it could be useful therapeutically. Um, but I would become really excited if somebody could do as good as rapamycin in a mouse. So I'm not asking for much in my view, right? We know rapamycin can extend lifespan 25% at least. 
We, again, our dose hasn't been optimized, but 25%, let's stick with that. And you can reverse functional declines in many tissues, right? Um, so show me you can do that with reprogramming and I'll be excited. Nobody's done even that yet. Yeah. Show me you can take a two and a half year old mouse, make it look like a one year old mouse, and then it lives to be five years old. I'll be really excited. Look, I'll be all on board. I might even come on your show and apologize for, <laughs> for saying that people were exaggerating, although they are exaggerating now. But but I think the um, the enthusiasm has just gotten so far ahead of where the science is. How is, so let's go back to kind of the, maybe help folks understand what the Yamanaka factors are doing and how one can be sure that even if you fix the aging problem, you don't create a new problem. So if the, if the objective right. is, I want to take the DNA as I had it when I was young, right? So yep. when I was 20, this is what my DNA looked like. Yep. Now that I'm 50, it looks different. It has literally these methyl groups that are sitting directly on the cysteine, you know, yep. residues. Like they're, it's literally on my DNA. Yep. Okay. We want to take those off. Maybe. Well, so first of all, it's important to understand why that's even a problem, right? Why yeah, people yeah. think so, that's so a problem, let's, right? Why, why is my 50-year-old crappy DNA not as good as my 20 year old yeah. DNA. So again, this is, you know, taking a step back to sort of basic, basic biology, right? So, so the DNA, right, is where all the information is, but then that DNA has to get turned into RNA. That's called transcription or gene expression. We'll just call it gene expression. Um, and then that RNA has to get turned into protein. And in general, it's the protein that does the work, right? So what these epigenetic changes, the methyl groups that you were talking about do primarily, we think, um, is affect uh, uh, expression of the genes. So basically what you're seeing with aging, we think is a shift in the epigenome that leads to certain genes being expressed that shouldn't be, and certain genes not being expressed that should be. And I think there's a little bit of a debate about which is more important right now, but it probably doesn't really matter, right? So the idea is you're getting things turned on and turned off inappropriately as we get older. So there's a loss of regulation, which probably contributes to a loss of homeostasis. And homeostasis is, I think, a really useful way to think about aging, right? If you're healthy, you your body is generally in homeostasis, right? And what happens as we get older is it becomes harder and harder for our body to maintain homeostasis. When you get out of homeostasis, if you're your defense mechanisms are working right, you can get back in, right? So you get COVID, for example, your immune system works, you're out of homeostasis, but you come back in and then you're okay again. I think as we get older, it gets harder to come back into homeostasis and that's why we start to see pathology and mortality. So, so let me differentiate two states of pathology. Um, my five-year-old son was on his scooter two weeks ago going down the steepest hill in the world, which I had no idea how I didn't <laughs> see that he was about to do that. Lit, like face planted. Yeah. And when he came up, all I could think is how quickly can we get to the hospital? I mean, he, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. I'm not making this up, Matt. Six days later, there was one little tiny yeah. scar. Eight or nine days later, you, you, you would have had no idea this kid ripped his face off on yeah. pavement. He's five. I get a cut. It's like nine months until the scar is yeah. gone. So there's a very clear distinction between a five-year-old's DNA and a 50-year-old's DNA in terms of how he can literally make new proteins that are better than my proteins. Yeah. Let me, let me stop you there just for a second, because yeah. I think this is actually the crux of the question, yeah. right? You said it's a different in your, difference in your DNA. Well, I'm DNA. asking. I think what yeah. I'm trying to get at is, yeah, how much of, because that's a clear case of the protein that he makes is better than my protein, right? He's, he's making much better proteins. Certainly functions better. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, well, I guess what I was getting at though is the question, one question I think that's really important here is there can be changes to the DNA to the sequence, right? So the sequence of the DNA is the information, Yep. right? Those are called mutations and those accumulate as we age. And that's, that's honestly what drives a lot of cancer, right? Yep. Yep. So we've known this for a long time. The epigenetic changes are sort of on top of that, right? Yeah, and while it more regulates expression, right. I'm wondering how much that factors into the example I just gave. Does it's it? It's a good question. It pro I'm sure it does to some yeah. extent, absolutely. Like what else explains why his collagen is so much better than mine? What are the other well, factors that go into that? I mean, I think there's there are probably many reasons why um, uh, healing 
declines with the, our ability to heal yeah. declines with age. I actually, again, I mean, I, I know we've talked about this before. I think inflammation is a huge driver of uh, our loss of ability to recover as we get older. So, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of things go wrong if you have a high level of sterile inflammation in your body, including the ability of stem cells to function. And a lot of, a lot of injuries require stem cells to function, to, mm -hmm. to build back you know, what, what's been broken. So it, it's complicated, I guess I would say, but, but the yeah, question it could is, be that I have more senescent cells and more senescent cell factors that are impairing the ability of cells yeah. to heal. Just to throw a wrench in that though, it, there's actually a body of, of thought that senescent cells actually promote wound healing. So it's, again, this is where the biology is so complicated. Wow. Um, but I think the, 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 the crux of the question we started from is if you only fix the epigenome, do you fix everything? How do you everything? know you fix all these things? Yeah, do you fix everything? And, and, and you know, nobody knows, I think is the fair answer. Yep. I think I would be um, shocked if that was the case, that epigenetic changes drive all of aging. I think the, the, but it's possible. I think we have to be open to that idea that epigenetic changes sit on top of or upstream of, you know, the other hallmarks of aging. First of all, let me say one thing. It won't fix everything. You will not fix mutations by fixing the epigenome, okay? The question is, do, do mutations, do they happen uh, with enough frequency to be a major contributor to functional declines that go along with aging? Certainly cancer, you can, you can point well, to. Well, cancer for sure, but let's now talk about something else, which is near and dear to your heart, no pun intended, but ejection fraction. Again, because you study dogs, yeah. uh, not only is cancer a big problem, but so is heart failure. So. Now we're dealing with a muscle, a set of cells that really aren't being turned over the way skin is. So yeah. when we think about the example of my son, when you think about your gut epithelium being sloughed off when you get sick, when you think about your fingernails and your hair, boy, it's really easy to think about those things as rapidly being turned over. But neurons, cardiac myocytes, right. these things don't right. get turned over a whole heck of a lot. So what is it about reprogramming that we think is going to fix an aging neuron or an aging cardiac myocyte. Yeah. So, that, I mean, again, I think, again, this is an area where the biology of what's really happening, is, at least to my knowledge, is so poorly understood that the, I think the real answer is we don't completely know. Yeah. I'm going to give a very simplistic answer, um, uh, which is that what people are trying to do is not reprogram all the way back to the pluripotent state. So this is called partial reprogramming, right? right? So. So Which would be pretty dangerous. Well, that's what I was going to say. If you're a single-celled organism, no problem going back to the, the pluripotent state, yeah. right? You can then, you can then you yeah. know, start over. In a complicated animal, if we reprogram you back to the pluripotent state, that's not going to end well for you, no. right? So, so I think the idea is to go back far enough that you uh, restore the epigenome to its uh, pristine state, young state, and then hope that when you do that, you restore gene expression to where it's supposed to be. Maybe one way to think about it is you restore the homeostatic mechanisms to a more youthful state where then the homeostatic mechanisms that all of our cells have can basically clean up the rest of the mess, right? Because we know as we get older, for example, we all accumulate damaged mitochondria, right? Changing the epigenome, which is the nuclear genome, isn't going to fix anything that's wrong with your mitochondria directly. But maybe by fixing the epigenome, you restore the homeostatic mechanisms that then maintain mitochondria in a healthy state, and you can fix the damage to the mitochondria, right? So that's the, that's the concept. Um, and again, you know, I would say the evidence is suggestive that if you do it just right, you can improve function in at least some aged tissues and or, or, uh, organs by partial reprogramming. I I've yet to see anything that convinces me that anybody has made, you know, uh, an old heart into a young heart in an old animal with partial reprogramming in, a, in the heart. But you can improve function. I would also say the same thing's true with rapamycin, right? We don't, I would not argue, we see that short-term treatment with rapamycin in mice makes an old heart function functionally to some extent, more like a young heart. I would never argue that we have, you know, taken that heart and now it's young. It's just in an old body. We don't know that. And that's hard to prove. Yep. But I think you can, you, you can see some evidence that it should be possible with partial reprogramming to do that. And, you know, the question is, will it work everywhere? Will it work in some tissues and organs and not in others? We don't really know. The brain is the one. So let's just say 
10, 20 years from now, people have figured out a lot of the complexity. We're starting to move these things into the clinic. You know, maybe, maybe we will see really, um, uh, large effects on lifespan and health span in mice. What I've yet to hear anybody give a convincing explanation of is how you do that in the brain. Because so much of who we are and what we are comes from our experiences and our memories. And, and so how do you ensure that you can reprogram somebody's brain in a way that isn't going to change that? And I, I, I just think that's going to be a really hard um, problem to overcome. But, you know, maybe somebody will figure it out. There are, there are tons of really smart people working in this area, lots of resources going into this area. So I think it's exciting. Again, my, my big um, concern is that we don't mislead people into thinking that, you know, that we're close to reversing aging. Um, and I think it's a problem from the perspective of the general public. I think it's a problem from the perspective of the scientific community. Sci sci other scientists look at that and they're like, this is snake oil, right? This is just not true. Yeah. And my, my concern with it is actually in terms of the impact it has on people, yeah. which are, hey, this is awesome. This thing's going to get worked out. I can basically <laughs> you can do whatever I want. I can do whatever. Yeah. I mean, literally, yeah. I, it's like I can sort of do what I want because in 10 years, they're going to reprogram me. And my view on that is even if that is true, yeah. or even if you have a high degree of confidence that that is true, how would you not hedge? Right. Like, you know, again, hedging right. is such an important part of how companies manage risk. So the difference between good companies and bad companies when it comes to risk management is everything. That's why some companies do really well in economic downturns and others don't. Yeah. It's, it's basically about risk management. And a very important part of risk management is indeed hedging. So if we think of ourselves each as little companies, so if, you know, you're the CEO of Matt Co., I'm the CEO of Pete Co., um, I can't think of a more important asset within my company to manage than my own life. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, sure. You know, do I have enough money Yeah. You know, do I, you know, have enough fun? Yeah. yeah. Those are all important assets, but like existing would be the number one asset and to not take a risk management approach of hedging to that is insane. And yet what I see is so many grand promises of this stuff and nobody's sort of paying attention to what they eat or how much exercise yeah. they do because I don't need to. This is going to be worked out. So, so the thing that I always find amazing is some of the most vocal advocates for this stuff, like don't have an ounce of muscle on them, don't <laughs> have, you know, they're overweight or whatever. Like they don't look healthy. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, you can do both, right? Yeah. You can, you can, you can believe that in 10 years we're going to fix this problem, but you could still, you know, actually care about your health. Yeah. No, I think that's a really Im important point. And, um, you know, having, again, been in this field for a long time now, uh, I, I think you can just look back, you know, over the last 20, 30 years and look at predictions people made on how fast these things were going to come along and get into, you know, the clinic. And none of that has happened, right? So I totally agree with you. I, I, I guess also being, you know, in the center of it, I... I take a view of, again, pretty strong skepticism when people say this is going to happen in 10, 15 years. I honestly have not appreciated that there are maybe a lot of people out there looking at what they read, you know, in the New York Times or on CNN and thinking to themselves, oh, I don't have to worry about this. This is going to get, get worked out. So, so my advice would be don't expect major changes in treatments to improve lifespan and health span in the next 20 years. And that doesn't mean I'm not optimistic. I think there are opportunities there. It would not surprise me if we do see some of these things get into the clinic, but I certainly wouldn't expect it because there are so many barriers that we don't yet appreciate. There are lots of barriers just in moving something through the clinical trial process. I think the, the, the reprogramming stuff is a perfect example. So you actually alluded to this earlier, right? Are there are there potential side effects, right? Absolutely. You push it too far, right? You reprogram too far, you're gone. Um, we know that can certain types of cancers are a side effect of this partial reprogramming in mice. Again, doesn't mean it can't be worked out, but there, there are really reasons, I think, to be concerned that this is going to be hard to implement therapeutically. The other thing I would say, even if those things can be worked out, the FDA is going to be extremely skeptical of this kind of approach. So, you know, as people move these through the clinical trial process, they are going to have to show with really rock solid, compelling data that these, 
these uh, reprogramming strategies are not going to cause significant side effects. So I think it's a long road before we have you know, reprogramming strategies that get into the clinic. Maybe somebody will identify a small molecule that can do some of this. And mm -hmm. I know people are working on that. Maybe that'll be an easier path. But, um, but for now, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna take a while. And that's, that's the best case scenario. That's if we really can, you know, partially, I'm gonna say partially reverse aging, reverse aspects of aging, um, it's still gonna be a long road. And I wonder if the first wins are going to be things like what David Sinclair has done, where yeah. you've got one very niche application. I think yeah. another one that would be amazing would be osteoarthritis. Like yeah. if you could re if you could figure out a way to regenerate yeah. human cartilage yeah. um, without joint replacements, you know, again, yeah. those are huge wins that seem at least a little more feasible. But again, I I agree with you. I think this stuff takes four times as long and cost four times as much yeah. as we think. Well, and I mean, you know, it's again, like building a house. Yeah. Right? And, and you like, and I are, are, I mean, honestly, we're pretty lucky, right? Because we know about a lot of this stuff. We actually can start practicing some of this stuff like rapamycin before it gets out there. Right. Again, I'm not, I'm not recommending anybody take rapamycin necessarily um, without talking to your physician first, but you know, we know this, this stuff and we, I think have at least you know, a pretty good idea of the relative risk reward, but in, before it gets out to where, you know, it, it hits the, the, uh, the mainstream, right. From a clinical perspective. Yeah. It's a, it's a really long path. I totally agree with what you said though, about, um, uh, specific indications where you can target it very precisely, hopefully, um, and where there's no other solution currently. Right. I think those are opportunities. Um, that's exactly the strategy that people have tried to take with senolytics, right? That these molecules yep. that will clear senescent cells. And even that's been hard, yes. right? I mean, Unity is the the the, the sort of largest uh, company in, in this space and their first clinical trial for osteoarthritis failed, right? So now they're looking at the eye because again, it's a, it's a, it's a nice indication where for some of these eye diseases, there isn't any solution. And you, you can, in principle, target it quite precisely to the eye. So yeah, I think that is yeah. exactly the strategy that people will be taking. Um, and hopefully it'll be successful. Um, I mean, I, look, I, 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 I want this stuff to work. I just, uh, I try to be a realist at the same time. Yeah, I guess the, the, the way I would kind of describe this to people is if you want to bring it back to a financial analogy, it's a lottery ticket. And so if your entire financial planning system is based on winning the lottery, <laughs> <laughs> the odds that it's you're going to win yeah. are pretty low. Yeah. Instead, if you're going to play the lottery, play it in the context of an otherwise great saving and investing strategy. Yeah. And th I guess the other thing I would add to that is that, and this is what we talked about before, you don't have to do everything right, right? Get 80% of the way there, right? Which nutritionally, I don't think is, I mean, for some people it's very challenging, but I think most people could do that. Uh, exercise, you don't have to, you don't have to optimize your physical activity, do something right. And that'll get you most of the way there. So yeah, I, I totally Yeah, agree. The exercise curve, which we've covered a lot in, in previous podcasts, um, you, you get most of the benefit going from, you get, I would say literally 50% of the benefit based on at least the, 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 the so-so epidemiologic data, about 50% of the full benefit of exercise is captured going from nothing to about 15 met hours per week. So, yeah. uh, you know, that would be depending on, you know, 15 mets times one hour would be one way to get there. But in reality, that's no one who's that unfit is going <laughs> to do 15 mets, but that would be like three hours a week of five mets yeah. to put that in perspective. And five mets is like a very, very brisk walk or right. a slow jog, right. you know, something to that effect. So you get a sense of like 15 met hours per week is by extension, I do about a hundred met hours per week of exercise. Yeah. I, I think of everything <laughs> in terms of met hours. But the point is that you can get, depending on the study, 30 to 50% yeah. of the benefit going from being completely sedentary to 15 met hours per week is pretty amazing. Which is a big benefit, right? And again, it's sort of remarkable that that information isn't out there. And for the gen, most people in the general public don't know that, right? Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know what the solution is. I think you're obviously doing a great public service by trying to get that information out there. But um, it's unfortunate because I think, again, you know, if most people understood how much benefit they could get, you know, from, from just getting out and moving a little bit, right? maybe a lot, maybe three hours a week is a lot for some people, but yeah. the magnitude of the benefit compared to the effort that, that you put in, 
Um, I think most people just don't know that. And, and it's unfortunate. So let's go back to the CR stuff. So yeah. what do we know about the effect of CR in the laboratory animals on the immune system? Right. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, uh, so first of all, laboratory uh, animals in the laboratory are kept in, in what's called a specific pathogen-free environment. So that doesn't mean there's no pathogens, but it's a relatively low pathogen in, environment where they are not obligated to really use their immune systems against all the challenges that you know we would face in the real world. So one question has come up, uh, are animals that are on calorie restriction immune compromised? And again, I think the data is a little bit mixed, but certainly people have there have been studies where people have done pathogen challenges on CR animals and they respond better. At least the old animals respond better than, than age-matched ad libitum fed control. So ad libitum just means as, eat as much as you want. Um, but then for certain types of challenges, they, the cal caloric restriction clearly causes a deficit. So Yeah, the sepsis experiments are pretty clear. Yeah. With the, the CR animals compared to controls, when you induce sepsis in them, the, the CR animals right. die much more quickly. Right. And so, of course, the obvious uh, implication of that is that maybe CR would impair immune function in people and lead to higher risk of all, all sorts of infectious yeah. diseases. And this this gets additionally complicated, though, by the, the, the question of, you know, optimal CR with optimal nutrition. So you might, sometimes you'll see this CRON, C-R-O-N, right? Caloric restriction with optimal nutrition or CRAN, caloric restriction with adequate nutrition, right? So that, that can be done in a mouse, right? We can control all of that. So we make sure that they get all the micronutrients and vitamins that they need when they're on this CR diet. When you move into the real world and people start practicing caloric restriction, that all goes out the window, right? Like I wouldn't, if I wanted to do caloric restriction off the top of my head, I wouldn't even know what to do to make sure that I'm getting optimal nutrition, right? And so in that state where you are CR without optimal nutrition, I think that's where I really become worried about the side effects, particularly as, as you raised um, immune deficits, because you may not, you may not be be getting the nutrient value or the specific micronutrients and vitamins that you need to maintain a functioning immune system. Sure, you may affect some aspects of the biology of aging in a way that you're aging biologically more slowly. That doesn't matter if you get influenza and die, right? So again, I think that's an additional complication that comes into play. When we start talking about, we haven't talked about all the other, you know, anti-aging nutritional strategies. When we start talking about recommending those nutritional strategies to the general public based on solely on mouse studies, I get really concerned because of this environmental complexity that humans live in. Um, not, and we haven't even talked about the genetic complexity, right? So there's all sorts of things that are just different about laboratory animals compared to people living in the real world. And then what can we say about frailty sarcopenia mm -hmm. as it changes in uh, an animal in a, in a CR environment? And, and can that be extrapolated also? Yeah. So I think it's, it's pretty clear, I think, that um, uh, most, much like rapamycin, most functional measures of aging seem to be preserved in calorically restricted animals, including measures of frailty and measures of sarcopenia. And you know, this, uh, the same thing again is true with rapamycin. This actually surprised a lot of people right. when the first studies were done because, you know, the expectation was because mTOR plays such a big role in muscle synthesis that if you inhibit mTOR with rapamycin or caloric restriction, which is a potent inhibitor of mTOR, that you would actually... Uh, see accelerated sarcopenia. And, and that just isn't the observation in laboratory animals. Um, again, we have to be careful not to extrapolate to people, but, but it doesn't seem to be the case that you lose muscle, uh, muscle mass and function in the way that people would define sarcopenia. I think the important complication here is that all of the caloric restriction studies that I'm aware of, when they look at muscle function, normalize the body weight. weight. Yeah. yeah. And the calorically restricted mice weigh substantially less than the ad libitum fed mice. Usually I think it's on the order of 30, 35% less. Yeah. So, what, yeah, so it's usually grip strength normalized to weight. Right. So what you're actually seeing is that the calorically restricted mice have maintained muscle function proportionate to their body weight. Yeah. And, and I don't know the answer to this, but it's something that I thought of when, when we were talking about this show, um, you know, is let's just say you did that in a person, right? So you've got 
you would you would be able to answer this, I'm sure. You've got a 60-year-old person, you know, who needs to lose 30% of their body weight. But of course, you want to maintain their muscle mass, yeah. right? Their muscle function. Would it would you view it as a good thing or a bad thing if they lost 30% of their body weight? And 30% and of their 30 muscle. And 30% of their strength. No, we, we, I don't think we would. And I don't think we would view it as a good thing if that, if that, because again, if you're telling me that someone needs to lose 30% of their body weight, presumably their body composition isn't great to begin with. Yeah. So no, I, I think you would, you would view that as maybe a better thing than where they started, but not optimal either. Yeah. Right. Optimal might be, you would lose 30% of your body weight but it would disproportionately be adipose tissue right. and you might only lose 10% of your strength or none at all. Right. Right. So again, this, this depending is just, on the change in lean body mass. Yeah. This is just a complication of the CR studies. And again, you know, even it's, it's hard for me sometimes it takes me, you know, 20, 30 minutes of trying to dig through the paper to really figure out, you know, how, how did they, how did, what normalization did they do to look at metabolic rate or muscle mass or lean mass or, or, or fat mass or muscle function, right? Um, but usually these studies will be normalized to body weight. This actually comes up also in some of the, um, the intermittent fasting studies where, you know, the question sometimes in these studies is, are they isocaloric or are they calorically restricted when yep. they're put on intermittent fasting? And, um, people will claim they're isocaloric, but the mice lose weight. And what they really are is isocaloric when normalized to body weight, right? So, you know, they're really calorically restricted, but you have to kind of dig to, 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 to get how the normalizations were done to really understand. Now, in, when we think about what we know in humans, you know, there was a study that looked at the difference in bone mineral density in people who underwent equal amounts of weight loss one driven by a caloric restriction strategy, one driven by an exercise driven strategy. And the exercise driven weight loss group did not experience a reduction in BMD, but the CR group did. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting. That's yet another thing that makes you think there's a little more nuance to this, um, which is not to say CR from a weight loss perspective isn't valuable, but it begs the question, you know, is CR the right tool for longevity? Once you've achieved optimal weight, is additional CR beneficial? Well, that makes the assumption we know what optimal weight is. I mean, I think that's kind of the crux of the question, right? We're yeah. asking, does CR impact longevity positively? We know if you go on CR, you're going to lose weight. So if the answer to that is yes, then by definition, optimal weight is lower than what we think, right? <laughs> well, so, I mean, in I humans that, though, right. Yeah, I know, yeah, but yeah, we don't, yeah, I, we don't I, know. I would say we still don't really know yeah what optimal weight is. Uh, so, so, so again, this, I think just reflects the, the challenges in coming to definitive answers. And I mean, I think maybe the way I think about it more so is, um, you know, what are the consequences? So, so what are the, what are the, uh, downsides potentially to caloric restriction? And if we don't know that caloric restriction has big benefits in terms of health span and perhaps lifespan, um, what are the downsides and do those downsides outweigh the uncertainty we have about whether yeah. caloric restriction is, is beneficial? And, and unfortunately, I think this is something that not very many people in this field pay attention to, right? People are, you know, we all expect if you do a clinical trial of a drug, you're going to report adverse events and, and you're going to look at side effects. Very rarely do people think about that before they write a book recommending that people should do diet X, right? Mm. Even in the clinical trials, some of the nutritional clinical trials, they don't really carefully monitor adverse events. And I think it's just, again, it's a bias in the way we think about interventions. We feel like nutritional interventions are by their very nature safe. And I think you know, certainly for extreme nutritional interventions, that's clearly not true. So I think we should be thinking about what are the risks associated with significant caloric restriction in people as a, as a therapeutic strategy. Let's go back to the, the, the sort of the study that will never be done again, right? The, 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 the NIA yeah, Wisconsin the monkey rhesus monkeys. So yeah. boy, if I can get my facts straight on this one, uh, I want to say that this study, this study started in the late eighties. Uh, it sounds about right. It might have even been, might have, which would have been probably the early 80s, I wow. think. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking rhesus monkeys. You know, these are my, these are animals that are going to live, what, 30 years potentially? Yeah. Uh, 40. <laughs> yeah. I think the average was closer, maybe closer to 40. Yeah. yeah. 
So let's talk about the experiment to end all experiments with respect to, to caloric restriction, which is the uh, very famous one we alluded to earlier at the University of Wisconsin and the NIA. So, it, and, and I, like I've, <laughs> I've read this study a thousand times. If I can get the details right once, I'll be happy. <laughs> but between the two of us, I hope we can do yeah. this. You had two groups of animals, one at the University of Wisconsin and one directly in Bethesda, Maryland. This was obviously a huge NIH funded effort. It ran for a couple of decades, given the lifespan of rhesus monkeys. The Wisconsin animals were fed, uh, the controls and the treatment uh, CR animals were fed a very processed diet. Right. Uh, at least after the fact, the examiner, the uh, investigators there suggested they wanted to more mimic a standard American diet. Uh, of note, I recall the amount of sugar pure sucrose in their diet was 28 and a half percent of total calories. So this is, this is, this is a, a high quality diet facetiously. The CR animals, the calorically restricted animals were fed 25% uh, of what the control animals were fed. And in that experiment, we found a benefit to caloric restriction. The That's right. CR animals outlived the control animals. And they had fewer age-related diseases. So I think if you if you go back to that original 2009 paper, you know, the lifespan effect is compelling and, and it looks real. But but what, again, you know, is I think really indicative of, of that it might be having an effect on biological aging is that they saw reduced rates of cancer, again, not surprisingly, as yep. we talked about in mice, but also heart disease um, and uh, metabolic disease. Yep. So you know, it's consistent with the idea that in that cohort of monkeys, again, given what you mentioned about the dietary composition, caloric restriction was in fact having a beneficial impact on the aging process. And those animals all came in at about the same age. Right. So that was sort of an apples to apples comparison. Now we go down the road to Bethesda. We have a totally different experiment in a way. And I, I don't know how much of this was deliberate and how much of it was not. The diets were different, yep. so that's that's maybe a good to contrast. These animals were actually fed the closest diet that could mimic their real diet, um, so it didn't have any you know sugar in it really. I think it was like about three percent sucrose. Um, you know, it was almost kind of like a you know a, a vegetarian pescatarian sort of diet. Uh, fish was the dominant source of protein, but it you know it was a high quality diet right. relative to the Wisconsin higher animals. quality for sure. Yep. Yeah. The complicating factor here was the animals didn't come in at all the same age. So you had some animals that came in young, some animals that came in old. The net result of the study was there was no difference. The CR animals did not outlive. And so while the Wisconsin study was first published in 2009 and it said CR works, the 2012 publication for NIA said CR doesn't work. Right. At least that's the lay press interpretation of it. So how do you kind of reconcile these findings? Yeah. So one, I think one thing to add to that is the the NIA study at Bethesda, um, in their paper at least, they did show some evidence for improvements in at least some health span metrics. So, so if you read that paper closely, you know what they're. I think what they're really saying is CR didn't extend lifespan, but it did have what appear to be some beneficial effects on health span mm -hmm. metrics. So it wasn't a complete failure yep. in the, in that sense. So, I mean, I think it's interesting because since then the, you know, when that, <laughs> I remember when the, the, the 2011 paper came out, the Wisconsin people were pretty upset. Um, understandably so, I think, um, since then they've had sort of a reconciliation paper and, and where they try to, you know, figure out what does it mean that we got these different results? And I, and I think, you know, they're, conclusion, which certainly is plausible, is that a lot of it comes down to the difference in diets. And if you look at the actual body weights of the animals and how much food they ate, not just the composition, but actually how much they ate, you know, you could make an argument that the Bethesda monkeys were somewhat slightly calorically restricted. Um, again, the controls, is, uh, the controls, That's yeah, right. sorry. Yes. The controls at Bethesda ate less than the controls Definitely. in Wisconsin. Right. And that would have narrowed the gap between them and the treatment animals. Right. Yes. And so then I think as you as you also alluded to, the fact that the Bethesda study was a little bit less controlled for age of onset. And I, I should I don't remember the details exactly. There were also some genetic differences in there. So there's a combination of factors that make it a little bit difficult to conclude that it all is about the diet, right? So the the monkeys in the Bethesda study came in at different ages. There was at least a hint 
I think that the the monkeys that came in at older ages, started CR at older ages, maybe got a somewhat of a benefit, whereas the ones that started early didn't get any benefit. So it's, it's complicated to interpret. And, you know, it, it's interesting because we see this a lot of times in the basic biology of AG, aging um, basic science studies where different labs will get different results in, a, in what seems to be the same exact experiment. Mm -hmm. And then you start to dig into it. And yeah, there's all these differences in the way it was done. It's really hard to know which of those differences contributed to the different outcomes. In this particular case, because it was a, you know, 30, 40 year experiment, we're never going to find out, right? This, yeah, as, it can't as be said, done again. Yeah, it just won't be repeated, both because of how long it takes and also because, again, the, um, the view on primate research, these are rhesus macaques, right? The view on primate research publicly has changed, right? So I just don't think we'll ever see that, that experiment done again. My gut feeling is that, um, that the Wisconsin study to some extent probably does mirror what is closer to a typical American situation, at least yep. these days. I, I do not believe that they started with that intention, but, but, but where we're at today, it probably is relatively, um, you know, as, as close as you can get for a controlled laboratory study. Uh, the, the question though, in my mind is between these two studies, do they suggest that caloric restriction you know, slows aging. And let's just start relative to the typical American diet, right? Somebody is moderately obese and they're eating terrible. Is it caloric restriction or is it just returning to, I think maybe what, what you would call like an optimal body weight, right? Optimal uh, uh, body mass. And, and I don't think we know the answer, right? I think from these studies, you can't draw many conclusions. I think the one thing you can do, and, 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 uh, Roz Anderson, who's still at Wisconsin has really, I think been a, a leader in this is you can study the molecular signatures of caloric restriction in the monkeys and ask, does it look similar to the molecular signatures of caloric restriction in rodents. And you mm -hmm. might ask, well, why would you do that? It seems obvious. But again, a lot of the questions that people have around caloric restriction studies in mice is will, the, will, will it work the same way in people? And obviously rhesus macaques are much closer evolutionarily to people than mice are. So if you see the same molecular changes, it's suggestive that caloric restriction is having the same molecular changes in people, certainly in primates. And in fact, that seems to be the case. A lot of what we see in terms of, you know, changes in mTOR signaling and mitochondrial function and, and other metabolic pathways is in fact shared between mice and monkeys. So I think that's a that is one important outcome from these studies that we can, we can definitely say is rock solid. Um, I tend to believe that the pretty dramatic declines in age-related disease seen in the Wisconsin studies are telling us something. But again, is it just telling us that not being obese reduces your risk for a lot of these diseases? And, and you know, we kind of already know that from the, from the human literature as well. Exactly. The other thing that isn't entirely clear, um, given that the NIA study uh, didn't find a difference, is we don't know how much of this was the CR versus the DR, the dietary restriction. In other words, what the Wisconsin experiment suggests is if you have an awful diet, reducing the amount of awful food you eat is a good thing. Right. What the NIA experiment doesn't tell us is the contrapositive. It doesn't suggest that if you have a good diet, eating less of that will help you live longer. It might. Yeah. But it isn't definitive. Yeah. Well, and, it's and so not, we don't know, right, if the Wisconsin animals lived longer simply because they lost weight yeah. or because they lost weight and they were eating less processed food. Right. Right. And I think the other thing to add to that is the NIA monkeys, which were eating, you know, what we'll call a superior diet to the Wisconsin monkeys, also ate less than the Wisconsin monkeys. In so, total. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, if you ate more of a good diet, would that be detrimental? We also don't know that. It's an, it's an interesting question, actually. And, and um, it, it's, it's too bad. We don't know the answer to that. But I think if they had been body weight matched or caloric consumption matched, that would have been an interesting comparison to be able to see, are there differences there? And the other thing that just kind of gets off into weeds that we don't need to necessarily go into is I don't really have a great understanding of even how we differ from the, the rhesus monkeys. So 
you know, I recently read Herman Ponser's book where he, I don't have you read it by the mm -hmm. way. No. So he kind of goes into the ecology and evolution of, of humans as a species yeah. and, and how different we are even from our closest evolutionary cousins. And one of the fundamental differences are incredible capacity to store excess energy. Yeah. So our metabolic rate, so this is, you know, he documents this through lots of assessments of doubly labeled water on not just ourselves, but also kind of, you know, hunter gatherers that are still around today. And then of course, all the primates is, you know, we're really kind of unique in our energy expenditure. Our, our energy needs are far greater than anything else. And you know, people like that would argue, hey, that was kind of an advantage that we took to allow our development, including our brain development. Yeah. So there's kind of a reason we're at the top of the food chain, which is we have a much greater brain and the price we pay for that is higher energy expenditure. And the price we pay for that is we better be able to store energy because we will have a much harder time tolerating a low energy environment. Yeah. And so he, he talks about how even when you put these animals in captivity and you overfeed them, they're not getting that much fatter, right? They're, they're actually putting on lean mass. Now they, you know, I think what you could argue, and he doesn't talk about this, but knowing what we know about human biology, you might argue that they're still getting metabolically sick. Right. Just as humans, when you're overfed, the real metabolic sickness comes not with the inflation of your subcutaneous fat. It's when that spills out into the viscera, into the liver, into the peripancreatic space, into the perinephric space, into the pericardial space. It's that fat that escapes the normal depot of sub-Q fat that is truly inflammatory and truly metabolically disturbing. So I throw all that in there just to say, like, it's just one more confounding variable that makes it yeah. difficult to compare us even to an organism as complex as a rhesus monkey. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, people certainly have made that criticism of the caloric restriction literature, you know, writ large, not even taking into account the monkey studies, but, but the mouse studies, right? That there are, you know, all sorts of differences between people and, and mice and the, the, the metabolic state that people have evolved to fill is just completely different. Having said that, you're absolutely right that even mice in the laboratory as they get older will show metabolic syndrome, right? You will see many of the same changes, insulin resistance, for example, that you see in, in people. And I don't- And do you see it absent the adiposity? Can you see it? Well, mice, mice gain adiposity with age too. Yeah. They, they do in fact uh, uh, become- obese with mm -hmm. age, right? On a, again, on a pretty crappy diet, right? A standard, yep. well, I don't know if it's crappy or not, the standard mouse diets, yep. right? So, and, and I don't remember what the number is. You may, you may, but in the Wisconsin study, right? A significant fraction of the control fed monkeys develop diabetes, right? So, yes. Uh, I, I want to say like a quarter of the controls were pre-diabetic yeah. by the yeah. end of the study. Again, which probably speaks to, even though they weren't overweight, when they get a, when you get, 28 and a half percent of your calories from sugar, right? It, it's right. probably going to impair your right. metabolism. Yeah. So I, I think though, the other, you know, the other point that's maybe worth at least just mentioning here, because I hear people, you know, talk about how certain diets are better for humans because it more mimics, you know, what we evolved to eat. Right. Um, I don't know whether that that's true or not. You could argue both sides of that. I don't see any particularly compelling reason to think that that was the optimal longevity diet that, that, you know, yeah, I, th ate I, th I think, I think that, I think that <laughs> argument is um, is illogical on on several fronts. The first is, uh, and I don't know who coined this phrase, but it's so ubiquitous that it's and it's obvious. Like by necessity, we had to be opportunistic omnivores. Right. Like there's simply no way about it. Like to even suggest that our hunter gatherer. Uh, forefathers were sitting around pontificating about what they were and were not going to eat. <laughs> what they should I mean, eat, yeah. I mean, it's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? Like, of course, I mean, and I don't think people are actually arguing that, yeah. but my point is it, it the, the argument becomes so nonsensical when you realize our evolution necessitated the most flexibility from a nutritional standpoint. Yes. And therefore, we ate anything and everything. And uh, I think because... We never probably existed in an environment where food abundance was so great right. that we could reach the level of overnutrition 
it gave us even more flexibility with what we could eat. Right. And and kind of where I was going with this, and I mean, it's in- interesting to think about is, does is that um, maybe part of the reason why humans seem to be fairly robust towards eating really, really crappy diets? I mean, certainly, obviously, we have an obesity epidemic and, and all of that stuff um, happening. But uh, people seem to be able to tolerate a wide variety of different diets, some of which are pretty darn bad for them for, for many, many years before you start to really see the, the, the significant consequences. So, and it so may I, be that I, would, I, would even, I, I was going to make a totally different point that's almost orthogonal to that, which is I, you, can, you can make a case that people can survive in really remarkable health with diets that look nothing like one right. another. In other words, you can look at somebody eating a really well-formulated, strict vegan diet where they're not getting any animal protein, which clearly our ancestors all had animal protein whenever they could. Um, they're often protein, a little protein malnourished, but they're very healthy. Yeah. And similarly, look at the opposite end of that spectrum. You can look at somebody on a ketogenic diet who, you know, the only thing they would have in common between that other person is probably a lot of leafy vegetables. But other than that, it's a much higher fat, higher protein yeah. diet. They can be very healthy. Yeah. That to me speaks to the resilience of our genome in terms of its interaction with nutrition. Yeah. And that's sort of where I started, which is that there's no reason to think that that the ancestral diet is best, right? Yeah. There, there's, uh, there's, there's no reason to, to think that. Um, but, the, but the other thing that I you know, was thinking about when I started down this path is that m- like many other things, our, as a species, our um, dietary options and the typical diet is evolving rapidly now, right? The, the quality of the food, the stuff that's in it, the preservatives, you know, is dramatically different than it was 50 years ago, right? Both in, in caloric content and nutritional content. And so in, in many ways, humans, you know- And a- taste. And taste, right, yeah. absolutely, which contributes to why a lot of people want to eat more, right? So high calorie, really good tasting food that's, that's often cheap. Um, but but so, so the environment that we evolved into, obviously, is completely different than it is today. But our environment is, is changing at an accelerating pace, I think. And that makes it really, again, complicated to try to get into the minutia of what is optimal. Maybe we should be thinking about what's good enough <laughs> first, right? Because um, uh, I think it's going to be really hard. And again, it's, it, it, this is where I struggle with the data that comes from epidemiological studies of people 20 years ago. The, 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 the environment, the food quality is just very different for most people today than well, it was even 20 years ago. this is where the grandmother test comes in, right? And this is where when I watch like the extremists on both sides argue, I, I say two things. The first is, look, there are really good and really bad ways to do your respective diet, right? So I don't want to hear somebody tell me that everybody on a vegan diet is doing well because I watched yeah. a lot of those kids yeah. in college and they literally were going to kill themselves eating ramen noodles and yeah. crackers and cookies all day. So you can be vegan and eat pure garbage. You could be keto and eat pure garbage. Yeah. The second thing I would say is if you're eating those diets well, and I'm being a little subjective when I say well, you're all shopping on the outer part of the, the perimeter of the grocery store. Yep. Like it doesn't matter if you're carnivore, vegan, keto, low carb, paleo, whatever. If you're, tr- if you're doing those diets in the way that they were at least thought to exist, you aren't going down any aisles of the grocery store. And that's kind of this grandmother test. Like if your great grandmother didn't recognize what you're eating, you just, it doesn't mean it's not good. Right. Like I don't want to say that a, a protein bar is not a good thing to eat. You just have to acknowledge there's a little more risk there right? There, there's, you know, eating a carrot is inherently less risky than <laughs> eating a protein bar with 14 ingredients in it. Yeah. That's just a fact. Um, and, and we, so we just have to have a little, I think this is what you're getting at. We just have a little bit of a humility around what is known, what is not known. And as we push the envelope of convenience, of nutrient density, of economics, price, you know, shareability, a portability, right? The ability to preserve things, we're going to take some risks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. So let's, let's talk about kind of more broadly a paper you wrote. How long has it been? Two years? 
Well, we probably wrote it longer than two years ago. I think it came out at the end of 2021. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's fairly recent. You're talking about, the, like science, I, yeah, about the science paper. Yeah, yeah. and I'd read it before, it no, so I've maybe lost November track. 2021 All right, or so, so. so talk about the impetus for that paper, which was I thought was a great paper, and we should discuss it in, in yeah, some detail. Yeah, so, um, so I, I was asked by one of the editors at, at Science to write a review, I think on M, mTOR, actually. And, and I was like, well, lots of people have written reviews on mTOR. I've been thinking a lot about you know caloric restriction, um, and particularly other nutritional strategies that, that people have been studying in the field, um, like ketogenic diet, protein restriction, time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. Um, and, you know, what do we actually know about those diets and, and their effects on aging, right? Because I was of the, before I started to really dive into it, and, and this isn't something that my lab researches directly. So we've <clears throat> previously done work on caloric restriction in, in, in invertebrates and C. elegans, but we never really have done a lot of dietary interventions in, in mice. And so, you know, before I kind of dove into the literature, I had this impression, you know, that all of these diets were similar in some ways and had maybe comparable effects on lifespan. At least that's the way it gets portrayed if you read some of these reviews. And I don't even like to call them reviews because I don't think, honestly, much of what gets into the literature as review articles are actually reviews. It's more one person's opinion piece on their specific thing that they study, which is unfortunate. But if you read most of the reviews on caloric restriction and other dietary interventions, they're very one-sided. And they, 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 they usually have phrases like, you know, fasting is known to have all of these fantastic benefits and, you know, slows aging in all, every place where it's been looked at. And you can see that for all these different dietary strategies. So, so I, I propose to the editor that, you know, maybe we should do a critical review of this space and think about what do we know? What do we don't know? Are they equivalent? And to the extent possible, can we gain any insights into whether or not these um, nutritional strategies, that whether there's evidence that they have an impact on the aging process in people? So that's kind of where we started. And I knew it was an ambitious thing to tackle when I said it. And I'm not sure I really appreciated exactly how challenging that was going to be, because it's a huge area um, of literature um, and it turns out, maybe not shockingly, that there are many more questions than there are answers when you really dive into it. Um, so we really just started. So what was your process? Yeah. So we really just start. The first step was, and I should say, I had a fa fantastic set of um, co-authors, all you know, really great early career scientists who who really helped me with this and did a lot of the, the legwork. Um, I just want to mention them by name, please do. I want, so so Alessandro Bito, who was a postdoc with me, um, uh, Mitchell Lee, who was a former graduate student with me, and Crystal Hill, who's at the Pennington Biomedical Research uh, Institute, and she works on FGF. 21 and protein restriction. So those three were co-authors on this paper with me, all just, just really fantastic early career scientists. So, so we started by um, asking ourselves, okay, what are the different popular dietary interventions that people have claimed have an effect on aging? And we, we came up with, I don't know, six or seven. Um, and they were the, the ones I've already mentioned. So there's true caloric restriction, which is pretty straightforward. That, you know, really just means limiting the overall caloric mm -hmm. intake that an animal gets, you know, by somewhere between 20 towards the low end and up the, the, the most I've ever seen is 65% of calories. And you were doing this in animals and humans, or were you were trying? We started, we were mostly focusing on mice. We, we yeah. narrowed it pretty quickly when we realized the scope of what, <laughs> what we had undertaken. So we could have tried to do it in, you know, fruit flies and yeah. worms and all that stuff. We said, let's start with mice, see what's known. And then try to look into humans and ask, are there parallels, yep. right? Okay. So caloric restriction, pretty straightforward. We actually don't go very deep into caloric restriction because that, that literature is huge. And other people I think have done a pretty good job of, of reviewing true caloric restriction. Um, but there are some points there that we probably want to touch on that are important. And then there are variants of caloric restriction, which include um, uh, intermittent fasting, uh, uh, time-restricted feeding, um, How I've, did you differentiate those two? Right. I, I have a definition, but I want to make sure yours is right. clear. So in mice, um, I think, well, so first of all, the first different, differentiator we need to put across all of these things is, uh, is it isocaloric or is it a flavor of caloric restriction? Because it turns out 
I would say the vast majority of studies in mice of all of the things that we're going to talk about are flavors of caloric restriction. And what I mean by that is the the experimental group ate less calories than the Right. So it's time-restricted feeding, but it's really caloric restriction in a narrower window. Intermittent caloric restriction, yep. maybe is the way you want to think of it. Yep. And there's actually some nuance there that that, that we can get to. But um, right. So so how am I differentiating between time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting? So I, in a, I would say, to, to my view, the easiest differentiator is time-restricted feeding is limiting the number of hours in any 24-hour period mm -hmm. that the animal or person eats, right? And yeah. there are obviously, you're, you're aware of this, there are flavors of time-restricted feeding in people where the window, you know, can be anywhere from 12 to 6, sometimes even more extreme than that, right? But you limit the hours per day that the animal or the person eats. Um, intermittent fasting, I would put in a 24-hour or more fast, yes. right? I think that's a... It, that's a reasonable that, that, definition. That's actually the definition I use, basically. Okay. And, and, yeah, an yeah. intermittent fast is a fast that occurs at a frequency of greater than once a day. Right, exactly. Yeah. The other thing I would say, though, is, is the time-restricted feeding gets even more complicated than that because there's evidence that it's not only about how big the window is, but where in the day the window is. And that's actually one of the things that that you know came out of our, our um, review of the literature is there is this there is this clear connection between how much we eat and when we eat that ties into circadian rhythms. And that circadian biology, even since this review came out, there have been papers that have come out that, that re-emphasize the importance of when we eat and what we eat. I don't think it's either, I think it's both, um, uh, that suggests that, that that's probably gonna be um, significant in terms of the, the the consequences of the long-term health effects. All right, I'm hoping I'm going to remember to come back to that, but okay. let's keep going. Okay. So then there's uh, what people call fasting mimicking diets, which are diets that have been um, engineered to some extent to induce the same metabolic changes as caloric restriction, usually very low sugar, relatively low protein, high fat, but also very low calorie. So that clearly goes in the bucket of a flavor of caloric restriction. There's ketogenic diets is, is another one. Um, uh, and then there's protein restriction. I think that's the, I so think that's isocaloric the group. isocaloric protein restriction. Well, both. So again, okay. you really have to look, you have to take each paper one by one mm -hmm. and figure out, is it isocaloric or isn't it? And that's in some cases just not, simply not possible because the data is just not there. But, but you have to look closely. So there are examples of both. I guess one way to think about it is, is it ad lib or not, is one way to sort of think about it. In other words, an ad lib ketogenic diet might end up restricting energy, yep. but non-deliberately. That's one way to think about it, but I don't I don't know that that answers the question of whether the benefit comes no, it from doesn't. caloric restriction. Oh, it, 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 it right? So that's doesn't. the complication. Yep. But I agree with you. That yep. is, it, it, it's... It's different, and you know we don't think about this much in in mice, but certainly in people, it's true. If you are not ad lib, there are psychological consequences to not eating when you want, to being hungry all the time. Good, bad, indifferent, but there are those are those have those those have biological consequences as well, right? Yep. So they are different, absolutely. Yep. Let's go back to the the circadian one. I want to kind of get the the insights there. Um, how? Do, so first of all, let's talk about what you know in mice. Yeah. And then let's figure out yeah. if there's any extrapolation. So, so when we wrote the paper, there wasn't much on this. I mean, people were thinking about it, particularly in the context of um, uh, time-restricted feeding, right? That, that there might be differences in the window of time-restricted feeding for, like, right. for in humans, right? Early in the day, late in the day. Um, there's been a couple of papers that have come out uh, since we wrote the review in mice that I think make a pretty compelling case that the lifespan benefit from say a 30% caloric restriction diet is a combination of when the animals are eating and how much they're eating. Most of the benefit seems to come from the cal calories. So, you know, let's just say uh, th this may not be exactly right, but I think it's close. Let's just say that you get a 30% lifespan extension from 30% caloric restriction. That the two thirds of that benefit comes from the calories, yep. but one third of the benefit actually comes from the fact that those mice eat all their food in a short window and are fasted essentially the rest of that 24 hour period. And if you force them to, I mean, and I say force, because if you give a calorically restricted mouse its food, it's going to eat it right away. Yep. So if you force them to eat little bits throughout the day, you lose a portion of that lifespan benefit, which is really interesting. Now, a mouse eating in an hour 
and then going 23 hours without food, what would we even compare that to I don't a know. human? Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I really don't, don't feel comfortable even speculating. So, I mean, I think that the, the you know, the, the first simplistic uh, approach would be to say, well, a mouse lives about three years, a human lives about, you know, I was thinking years. more of like, how long does a mouse take before it dies from starvation? Yeah, so that's where I was going to go next. I think that, that sort of length of lifespan is not the approach no. you take when it comes to, to metabolism. So, so I would say that, uh, and this is total back of the envelope calculation, but a one day, maybe it's like a one to one to four ratio. So a one day mouse fast might be a four or five day fast in, in people. Um, but that's not even perfectly true because a mouse you know, a mouse will go into ketosis relatively quickly within 24 hours, right? Sure. Uh, and a human can go into ketosis that quickly, depending a depending little bit on, on their incoming diet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so it, it's not a, it's not a perfect equivalency, but, but, but maybe one to four or five. Um, I hope I'm not saying something totally stupid here, but I think that's probably pretty close. Um, so yeah. So again, it's very different, uh, potentially these kinds of studies in mice. The other thing that I think most people don't appreciate unless they've actually done these caloric restriction experiments is that if you go back to the, you know, the classic experiments of, of uh, uh, Rick Weindruck and Roy Walford, um, those, were, those mice are fed a calorically restricted diet. They're also fed three times a week. So, so they are in fact, you I mean, know, it's insane. fasting. It's like they're, they're basically doing a two week fast between their meals. Yeah. And so what you see, even in 24 hours in a fasted mouse, is you see pretty dramatic reductions in organ size, right? And so, you know, if the mice are being fed three times a week, they're going through this, you know, uh, uh, reduction in organ size and then this really Huge rapid expansion. hypertrophy, right? Yeah. Right. So, and you can see that that sort of uh, decrease in organ size and then rapid rapid increase even on some of the fasting mimicking diet work that Walter Longo has done. So again, you know, I think this just... Has anybody done their reverse experiment where you try to actually mimic the way humans eat and you take two groups of mice and the controls are fed, whatever, 100% of the nutrient, but they're fed every two hours over the course of the day. And the CR group are given, you know, 70% of that, but they're fed at the same time intervals constantly throughout the day. Yep. In other words, you make it purely a calorie thing and you really take out the fasting except when they're sleeping. Yep. Yeah. In fact, I think at least one of these two studies that, that, that I was referring to did, did that, right? And oh, so that's how they were able to identify that two thirds of the benefit came from the reduction in calories and like a third that. of yeah. it came from the additional fast. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and in my mind, I think this is really important because this is one of the this is one of the points that we made in our review. Is if you look at the vast majority of the literature around intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding and fasting mimicking diets, they're calorically restricted. So there there there's a fasting period and a caloric restriction component, and none of the prior studies really really teased that out in mm. a way that allowed us to have an understanding of how much is calories and how much is fasting and maybe how much is when you're fasted. That still, I think, is an open question. Okay. So what else can we say about early feeding versus late feeding? What do we know? You mean about early that? in life? like No, the, early in day versus late oh, in day. Yeah. I mean, this is an area I'll admit I'm not I'm not an expert in, so I don't honestly have a, an opinion about which is better. Um, and again, this is where I think mice are are not going to be a good model yeah. for humans, right? So, so I think that we really those studies need to be done in people. And you know, again, that gets now. Some some have suggested that an early feeding window versus a late feeding window produces better pairing of our insulin sensitivity to our yep. nutrient arrival, right? I think that makes sense, yeah. right? I mean, I think I think most most people would agree that particularly if you're eating uh eating something that causes your blood sugar to spike, that doing that right before you go to bed it probably suboptimal, right? Yep. So I think that maybe that can explain, you know, most of that uh, the, the observation that has been made that that it might be better to do if you're going to do a time restricted feeding, it might be better earlier, some, somewhere at least right, not right before bedtime, yeah. I guess I would say. Um, but again, I think these, these kinds of questions are really complicated in, in humans because, you know, you could ask what benefit are we looking at, right? So if you're looking at, you know, uh, overnight blood glucose levels, 
Sure. It makes, it no makes perfect sense. Yeah, of course. If you're totally looking at different. sleep quality, maybe it's going to be different. Or maybe it's going to be different in different people, right? If you're looking at other biomarkers, you know, again, it could be different. So, so I think it's, again, in my mind, at least, maybe you have a different opinion on this. In my mind, at least, it's not even really clear how we evaluate, you know, what is better and what is suboptimal. It may depend on what your, what your endpoint is, what you're actually interested in, in optimizing, right? Yeah. I mean, clinically, we see in people who wear CGM that early feeding produces an overall lower average glucose for yeah. sure, because even if you get the same spike, let's say with an early, like if you're doing the same meal early in the day versus late in the day, there's something about how long it takes to come down at night versus in the morning. Now that could be you're more insulin sensitive in the morning and therefore it comes down quicker. Um, it could be something to do with pairing sleep with the nutrition that, that yeah. is tweaking this and that there's a feedback loop where the excess glucose creates a little more cortisol. You get a little more hepatic glucose output. Again, that, I don't really know if that makes sense. I mean, I've heard people argue that, but at the same time, you theoretically should have the lowest cortisol at night anyway. So that really shouldn't be an issue. I, I don't really know what it is other than just to say I've observed it empirically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it generally doesn't produce a great quality of sleep. But um, again, to me, this starts to get into, <laughs> which I want to hear more about, but this gets into the minutia of like, you know, yeah. at some point you just got to focus more on other things, but, I, but I, mean, <laughs> I want to go down this rabbit hole just for the sake of completeness. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I, again, I think I've, that, that to some extent, that's almost where we ended up, right? Was that it's, you know, I think, I, I guess, let me give the big picture answer for yeah. why I think um, it, this is important. So I think these nutritional intervention studies in mice are very powerful for dissecting the biological mechanisms that underlie the effects that they have. And some of these diets clearly have effects on aging, right? Um, I, I'm very, very hesitant to suggest that people should adopt any of these diets based on the rodent literature where it's at today. Um, and I think there are a whole variety of, of, of reasons for that, but, but that's kind of where I ended up, right? I think they're super useful for understanding the biology. I'm, I'm really not sure that they're going to work the same way in, in what humans. What did you learn about the protein restriction in the ketogenic diet mechanistically in the mice? Yeah. So, so again, the, the couple things to say about that, the ketogenic diet studies, there've really only been two that I'm aware of that looked at lifespan and health span in, in mice. Um, they were, they were slightly different, uh, but in mice, you have to go to really, really low sugar to actually get the mice to go into ketosis. So yeah, these, I mean, these you almost are have to eliminate essentially one percent or less yeah. carbohydrate diets. So again, that's a difference from from people. Um, the the stud, one of the studies that fed a ketogenic diet lifelong saw no effect on lifespan, but they did an intermittent ketogenic diet. I don't remember the exact protocol, but it was something like every other day, or maybe once every three days, or something. Um, and there, there was about a, I think a 15% increase in lifespan. And I'm sorry, what did they do on the other days? The animals? Ad a regular diet. Oh, sorry. Regular diet. Wow. Yeah. So it was just back and forth between the control mm. diet and the ketogenic okay. diet. Okay. Yeah. And that didn't result in caloric restriction. The uh, that's the thing. The mice were calorically restricted. So it's oh. in some ways it's a intermittent caloric restriction, right? And this is what I would say. It's also interesting because the fasting mimicking diet papers are intermittent ketogenic diets. So, so I think that, you know, maybe that's one thing to agree on is that intermittent ketogenic diets in mice can increase lifespan and seem to have benefits for health span. Um, but, uh, but the ketogenic, the, the effects aren't huge, right? Again, that's the other take home I would say from, from our study. There are two nutritional interventions that relatively consistently give big effects on lifespan. One is caloric restriction and one is protein restriction. And they, you know, again, caloric restriction, the, the most extreme study that I've seen is 65% restriction. And that hmm. gave about a 65% increase in lifespan. So these are big, big wow. effect sizes. Um, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, and that's that this, uh, 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 Walford and Weindrick and Walford paper. Okay. Okay. And, and when did they start that? And how long did that restriction last? That's a good question. I don't remember. I, it was probably six or nine months. I think most of their studies were, you know, early onset caloric restriction. Um, and they th this study was really interesting because they did, you know, a graded response from, you know, 90%, 80%, 60%, 
50%, 40% of ad lib. And you get essentially a graded response in lifespan. And it's roughly linear. So, so I think, you know, that's why I said about 60. So 90% animals? 90% no, no, but they didn't go that far. They, oh, didn't, okay, go, they okay. didn't go beyond 60 or 65. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. And I also think this is an interesting study because I don't think you could do that study today because the animal care... Uh, uh, wouldn't allow you to. Yeah, this gets 60, back to a, an, an, an element that we don't think about enough, which is what were those? What did those mice feel like? Those, like <laughs> yeah. think about how angry those mice would have been <laughs> on a third of their normal caloric yeah, intake. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I haven't done these kind of mouse caloric restriction studies myself. I've obviously talked to a lot of people who did. I think to really appreciate that, you've got to probably be in the animal room, you know, feeding them, yeah. seeing them, right? Yeah. Certainly. Um, uh, activity goes up quite dramatically. And that's one of the remarkable things about caloric restriction in mice is that they are more active throughout life um, than ad lib fed mice are. And maybe it's a sort of, you know, uh, uh, foraging response, evolutionarily selected foraging response, but but they are definitely, you give them a running wheel and they'll just run and run and run and run. Um, so yeah, there are behavioral changes for sure in mice that are calorically restricted. And this is actually one of my, real concerns about caloric restriction in people. I mean, I, I think first of all, you know, we should, we should be realistic and, and recognize you're never going to get a significant fraction of the population to calorically restrict, right? Yeah. It's hard enough to get people to calorically restrict down to a healthy weight to get them to go 30% beyond that. It's just not going to happen. Um, but of the people I know who, and I, I mean, being in this field, I, I, I know people who have done every possible, you know, anti-aging intervention you could imagine. And of the people I know, and I know a lot of people who've dabbled in various forms of caloric restriction, um, certainly true caloric restriction has real psychological consequences. And I, and, and, and I really would be concerned, um, I have been concerned for some of the people I know who've done this, uh, if a lot of, you know, if we, if we started trying to do this in, in the general public, right. I mean, there are, there's social isolation that you get when you're calorically restricting, but then there's, you know, the, the biological changes in the brain and you're hungry all the time. So again, I, I just think we, you know, we often don't appreciate those aspects of some of these nutritional interventions. But in the mice, I think it's hard to know what their psychological consequences and, and, and are. And what do we know about caloric restriction later in life in the mice versus yeah. earlier? I mean, the, the sort of traditional thinking is you you have a window in which you can do it early and beyond that, it's not as effective. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to talk about some data that counter that. And then, of course, you have the NIA experiment we talked about earlier in the, where, mon in the monkeys where yeah. the early fast yeah. didn't improve longevity. Yeah. The late fast appears to have, although right. that was sort of a subgroup analysis. It's hard to, hard to draw causation there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so what I would say about the mice is that for a long time, the sort of dogma was that caloric restriction didn't work if, if you started it, you know, past, I don't know, 15 months of age, which is maybe the mouse equivalent of a 40, 50 year old person. Um, so most of the early caloric restriction studies were done, like I said, starting sometimes pre-development, uh, the early rat studies were pre-development and then sometimes, you know, six, nine months of, of age. Um, so that was sort of when I first started in the field, that's kind of what I was told, like, this is a settled question. Um, late, more recent studies that have been done in, in some ways, more carefully, different diets, uh, certainly, um, if you do a graded onset of caloric restriction, in other words, don't go right from ad lib to 40% restriction yep. the next day. If you do sort of a graded onset, you can get lifespan benefits from caloric restriction, you know, 20, 22 months of age. So whether it's as good as starting early, I think the consensus is still that the answer is no. You're never going to get the same magnitude of benefit from caloric restriction starting late as you do starting early. But that could be wrong. So I would say that's the consensus, but I don't think we know we know for sure whether it's possible if you did it just right that you could get, you know, most or all of the benefits from starting late in life. So Matt, on this topic of CR in mice, you know, um again, the the dogma has generally been and I've been victim of this just sort of blindly assuming it to be the case that, you know, CR in mice only works early in life. Uh, again, is that how how applicable is that to humans? I don't know. Um, but you know, a listener of the podcast actually pointed uh, out that you know, in fact, there are some data that that try to get at this question elsewhere. So there, there's, there's just 
Han study to 2019, which we'll link to, that looked at um, 800 female uh, mice. Now, this is a pretty elegant experiment, right? So for the first three months, they ran these mice out uh, on an ad libitum diet. And then at three months, they were split, randomized to, I believe, a 40% yeah, calorie restriction versus ad lib. They ran that out until 24 months. And then each of those groups was further split, split ad lib versus continued on. So you had one group that was, everybody's the same till three months, one group that spent the rest of their life on dietary restriction, one group that spent the rest of their life ad lib, and then you had the middle groups. But two, 21 months calorie restricted, then to ad lib, right. 21 months uh, ad lib to then calorie restricted. Okay, so the ends of this were not interesting, right? Meaning the ad lib group lived the shortest. Uh, we, we were looking at the figure earlier today, 1200 days, roughly. Going back to a maximum lifespan. Yeah, maximum lifespan. Yeah. That's right. Median lifespan would have been looking at the graph about 900 days. Yeah, which is pretty good. Again, yeah. So I was going to say, how does that stack up yeah. with what we talked about on the last podcast about length yeah. of life? That's of a control. reasonable uh, lifespan for control. I think, if I remember correctly, this was also done not in C57 Black Six, but in a, a little bit longer lived hybrid strain. That's right, so, F1 hybrid. Yeah. So yep. it's reasonable lifespan. Yeah. Okay. Looking at the all CR all day mice, looks like they had a maximum lifespan of just below, yeah, call it 1400 and change yeah. with a median that I'm going to say was about 1150. Yeah. So it's good, good lifespan extension. Okay. So, so now what's interesting is the middle groups, yep. which is really trying. So I'm going to just give you my little iPad so you can look at that table, which we'll link to <laughs> it's this. okay. I got it right here. You got it right here? All right. So, 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 so. I just love I the remember, picture. I remember the take home You do? Here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened to the two middle groups? Right. So I mean, the interesting thing, well, I, the one thing I would say is I think this is a pretty early onset of CR. And it, this, it really is. This Three gets, months. Yeah. yeah. This gets back to what I was talking about before that, you know, it, it, it seems likely from the early studies that were done in rats where they got some of these really, really large effects, that, that some of the benefits of CR come from actually being restricted during development itself, right? So, so I think that's useful to, to put into context. So then the big question here is what happens if you start caloric restriction late in life or what this study did that I'm not really aware of anybody, you know, doing, doing previously is kind of the, the flip. It's almost like a crossover. Design, That's right. Right. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. So, so in this case, um, when they, uh, when they started CR late in life, there is a significant, but not huge effect. Like the, the magnitude of the lifespan extension is much less than in the mice that were on CR from three months of age. That makes sense. That fits with what else is in the literature. Um, there have been, there were earlier studies. I think Steve Spindler did one, you know, not too many years, maybe four or five years before this one yep. that, that did sort of a similar sort of approach that starting around 15 months of age. And they saw a significant, but not as large benefit from starting late in life. So that seems to be the consensus. The thing that's really interesting here is, you know, what happens if you're you know, CR'd for uh, an earlier period in life and then back on AL, do you lose the benefit? And it seems like the answer is no, right? Those animals actually were longer lived than the mice that went on CR late in life. So, yeah. so you could ask, I mean, you could do so, you could ask some questions about, is it about the total amount of your life that you're restricted? Is it about when you go on and when you come off? And I think in mice, this is still an open question. We don't really know what the mechanisms are. Although the early in this. life mice had a longer median, the, the median life expectancy was The longer. ones that were on CR and then switched to ad libitum. Yes. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. The yeah. So they lived a little bit longer, but the bigger difference was the median life expectancy was higher than the yes. flip, than the flipped group. Yes. Although I think, I think we're, we have a little bit different in def difference in definitions, right? I tend, I, I would, I tend to think first about median. You seem to think first about maximum, but yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is right. The yep. median lifespan is uh, quite different that's between right. those two groups. The it maximum, is the difference. The maximum is very trivial. Yeah, yep. that's right. So, so, I mean, I think, um, again, you know, the real question here is, well, aside from what does this mean for humans, which I would say we can't draw too many conclusions from humans from this, but what is, what is the underlying mechanism? And, and is it really just about how the total amount of time that you've been on CR or is it, is there an interaction with how old you are, the developmental process, and then, you know, what happens at the end of life, which is mostly the degenerative process and, and when you go on CR. Yeah.
I think maybe one thing that's that's worth um, adding to this too is it's it's an interesting comparison to what we know about mTOR and rapamycin, right? So with rapamycin, yeah. you know, the data are pretty clear that you can start rapamycin certainly well into middle age and maybe even into very old age and get most of the benefit. So if you compare the curve here where they started the mice on CR at 22 or 24 months, whatever it is, the effect is pretty small yep. compared to CR. With rapamycin, you get almost exactly the same benefit starting at 20, 22, 24 months as you do starting early in life. So that might tell us that there's a difference, right? There clearly there's is a, a different difference. mechanism potentially as well. It, it could it, be that Rapa is doing something least. different, yeah. or it's a different dose effect. Relative yeah, exactly. To, yeah. So, so that that's an open question. Exactly why it's different, but it seems to be it seems to be different. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because you know we talked about that with Rich Miller on his podcast, which was a fortuitous accident, right? Basically, because they couldn't <laughs> yeah, get the, the formulation yeah. of rapamycin in that first story ITP in study. One of my favorite stories yeah. in science. Yeah. Yeah, tell people that story. Yeah, it's... right. So, um, so take a step back. the The NIA started this program called the Interventions Testing Program. Um, must have been the early '90s, and the idea here was was maybe it was early 2000s. Sorry, I'm dating myself again, losing my decade. So early 2000s, um, and the idea here was, I think, really smart. The idea was that we could create a tool where the scientific community could nominate interventions for lifespan testing in mice. And it was set up so that it would be done in, in triplicate, right? So there were three, three sites, there still are three sites for the ITP. Um, so anybody in the community can nominate any intervention. Uh, there's a selection committee that selects them every, every year. Um, and if an intervention is selected, then the, the intervention testing program sites start the cohorts of mice on that intervention you know, in whatever year it was selected for. So sometime back in the early 2000s, um, Dave Sharp nominated rapamycin. And, you know, in some ways he was ahead of his time because this was, I think when he nominated rapamycin, it was even before the first invertebrate studies on mTOR and rapamycin, it was right around the same time they were being published. So, you know, he, I think, was thinking about it from a cancer perspective primarily. In any case, he nominated rapamycin, it got selected, it went into the cohort, and they typically test five or six interventions or drugs each year. So they have a huge number of animals at each of these three sites that are destined for these interventions to be tested in. And rapamycin was one of them. And um, Randy Strong, who's one of the, the PIs on the ITP, um, who's also got a strong biochemistry background, I think recognized pretty quickly that the rapamycin wasn't stable in the food. We could actually come back to this if you want to, because this is relevant for, for people as well. So, mm -hmm. and, it, and it gets broken down in the pH of the, the gut, right? So, the, so basically if they just put the, the powder in the food, there's no bioavailability. It doesn't get taken up by the mice. And so they recognized that right when they were supposed to start the experiment. And, you know, of course they were like, crap, what do we do? You know, we could just not test rapamycin, um, and I, and I don't know if it was Randy or who somebody said, well, I think I can figure out a way to, to stabilize the rapamycin, put it in the food so that we can give it to the mice and we can do the lifespan experiment. I think what they didn't recognize was that it was going to take 18 months or so to figure this out. So once they finally developed this in what they call E-Rapa, encapsulated rapamycin, um, it's, it, it's basically designed so that it won't break down in the, in the gastric pH. Once they developed that, they were now 18 months into this lifespan experiment. Before this, everybody, I think everybody, myself included in the field, thought you had to start early in life or you weren't going to get much of a benefit. There was really almost no chance a drug was going to increase lifespan starting that late in life. But fortunately, they went ahead with the experiment starting at 20 months of age and what they found was that they got this robust lifespan extension from starting with rapamycin treatment at 20 months of age. And just to give some context, that's about the mouse equivalent of a 60 or 65 year old person. And I love the experiment. I love the outcome, obviously, because, you know, first of all, nobody thought it was going to work except yeah. maybe Rich Miller. Maybe I'll give Rich credit. Maybe he thought it was going to work. Um, uh, and it was really the first time anybody had convincingly shown that you could start a Intervention, intervention. Yeah, not even in a drug. middle yeah. age in a mouse and get robust lifespan extension. And for me, honestly, I reviewed that paper. And when I, when I, first time I saw that result, I'm like, this changes everything. We actually have a chance for translational geroscience because, because 
you might be able to intervene late in the aging process and have significant impact. So it, it, honestly, in, in, that was 2009 when Nine, the paper yeah. came out. So in the 13 years since then, the whole paradigm in the shield has, field has changed, right? Most people who are studying interventions today are studying things that they test for efficacy late in life because that's what we need to do in people. So it was a super important result for the field for that reason. And it all came about by an accident. Nobody would have designed that study that way beforehand, right? Yep. So yeah, it's fortuitous for sure. Now you were going to make a point about the uh, bioavailability of rabbit yeah. as well. So this is something that's only recently come across my radar, but I've heard several um, results now that convince me that it, that it's true. So you know, I mentioned the reason why they had to make this e rapa is because rapamycin isn't stable at the gastric pH of mice. Same thing seems to be true in people. So you know, there are people who are getting their rapamycin from uh, from like the rapamune, which is the brand name generic, or the brand name serolimus that likes comes comes in these triangles shake pills. Yep. There are also people who are getting it from compounding pharmacies. And I've heard of several cases now where the bioavailability is much lower in the, the compounded rapamycin in a capsule than in the actual rapamycin. The triangle, the, 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 the blue, the white and yellow triangle. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just something for people to be aware of. And I don't think most physicians are aware of it. I don't think most compounding pharmacies I, are I'd aware of it. I'll be honest with you. I'd, we've never had it compounded. Yeah. So we've only prescribed, uh, Sirolimus yep. or, uh, or Rapimune. And, um, you know, it's not a cheap drug, so I right. can understand why there's a desire to compound right. it because it's, I don't know, it's gotta be like five, six bucks a milligram. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's about right. Yeah. yeah. So Matt, obviously one of the other things that came out of that review article in the animal stuff was, as you said, the protein restriction. And I think of all the topics in nutrition, this is the one I'm most interested in. Uh, I really don't care that much about fat and carbs. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but I care an awful lot about protein. Um, you know, in fact, when you came over today, you probably saw me chasing down what was left of a protein shake. And I think <laughs> right. I was mentioning to you or my wife, like, that's the only part of nutrition that is kind of, um, I don't want to say a chore, but it, it's a very deliberate part of how I go about the day, which is I really have to think about it. And the reason is I'm trying to eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight spread out into four buckets. Right. Right, because if you, you know, I think there's re reasonable evidence to suggest that if you consume too much protein in one sitting, uh, and it's typically more than about 0.25 grams per pound, is the general thinking, you're going to end up oxidizing some of that protein. So it's not that it's harmful; it's just that you're not getting the amino acids you need for muscle protein synthesis, which is, of course, our objective. So that means I'm kind of walking around trying to get 40 grams here, 40 grams there, 40 grams here, 40 grams there. And truthfully, that's um, not trivial if you're not willing to consume a whole bunch of crap with it. I mean, if you're really just trying to focus on the protein quality. So look, the RDA says I'm crazy, right? The recommended daily allowance of protein is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, right? which is less than half of what I would consume. Why, why, where do you see the and by the way, it's not just that I'm making up the amount that I'm consuming. I, I'm doing it on the basis of other data that suggests that this is the amount of protein consumption you need for optimal muscle protein right. synthesis. Right. So where does this disconnect? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, first of all, um, <clears throat> we can talk about the rodent studies, right, which is in the, the biology of aging. I think the RDA question, you know, they're, they're, that, that's a different question. It's my understanding that that actually was developed to be a protein balance for 95% of the population when sedentary, right? So I think <clears throat> what that means, first of all, that's a minimum amount, not yeah. necessarily the optimal amount. And it probably very much depends on lifestyle, right? Um, and lean body mass to begin with, absolutely. even though it's sort of normalized yeah. too. So it, I think, but, I think I, and the reason why I, I bring this up is I think there's a lot, again, a lot of confusion among the general public about what the RDA means. And it's not... <laughs> It's not necessarily a bad thing to be above the RDA in some areas, right? Yep. Maybe a lot of areas. So I think that's just worth worth you know uh, expanding on just just a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, I think I, I agree completely. I, I I sort of jokingly think of the RDA for protein as what you need to not waste away and wither up and die. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So right. So you're not losing muscle mass. Yeah. yeah. So so then the the question of what is the relationship between protein and aging, I think, is a really important yeah. one, and it's gotten a lot of attention in the field. Um, 
Uh, and like I think a lot of other things, there's a lack of clarity about what we actually know and what we should be recommending to people. So let's take a step back and start with the animal studies, the, the mouse studies. Um, I think there it's pretty clear that you can extend lifespan through protein restriction. And there are actually, again, a couple of flavors of protein restriction. You can restrict all protein down to you know some, some percentage, some low percentage, um, or you can restrict specific amino acids, particularly branch um, chains. Tri tryptophan, oh. methionine, or branch chain amino acids are the ones that have been studied. And, and again, I make that distinction because it's not really clear that the mechanisms are the same across these different flavors of, of protein res restriction. The common mechanism that, that does seem to uh, potentially underlie all of these forms of protein restriction is inhibition of mTOR. And again, that's partly why this um, becomes complicated, when we, especially when we start talking about extrapolation to human. You and I both recognize that inhibition of mTOR can have beneficial effects in the context of aging and health span, certainly in mice, almost certainly in people, I would say. Um, and protein is an activator of mTOR. And we know a fair amount about the biochemistry of that, that, that particularly branch chain amino acids can directly activate mTOR through cestrins, and that's sort of all worked out. Um, and so it seems counter, it seems <clears throat> intuitive that protein restriction would be beneficial by turning down mTOR. It seems counterintuitive that that what you were just talking about would be beneficial because you might be hyperactivating mTOR. So we can dive into that. Yep. But I think that that's kind of the that's the that's the simplest possible mechanism I can think of for why protein restriction, especially branch chain amino acid restriction, would be having an impact on lifespan and health span in mice. Um, the other player that seems to be important, particularly in um, total protein restriction is uh, a protein called FGF21, fibroblast growth factor 21, that is uh, secreted in response to a low protein diet and then has effects on liver metabolism and, and also inhibition of mTOR reduction of IGF-1. So that seems to be required for the lifespan extension that is seen from protein restriction in mice potentially partially upstream of, of mTOR and, and liver metabolism. The interesting thing there is FGF21 overexpression by itself has also been reported to be sufficient to extend lifespan in mice. So, um, so it kind of fits that that, that could be part of the, the story. Mm -hmm. um, so the question then, one question is, is protein restriction always beneficial in mice and can we separate it from caloric? restriction. And so th this is where you really have to look closely at the studies and determine, you know, did the mice on protein restriction eat less, eat the same amount and eat more? And it's interesting because you can actually find examples of all of those. And honestly, I don't really understand why that's the case, except it's something about the different compositions of the diet. Um, uh, what does seem to be the case is that when you restrict for certain amino acids, you're, if you're deficient for a, a, a methionine, for example, or tryptophan, the mice absolutely will eat more and they don't gain weight and they do seem to live a little bit longer. So that could be a somewhat distinct mechanism there hmm. um, that we don't really understand. So, so tell me, what was the most compelling evidence you saw when you tried to tease apart the relationship between protein and total intake? Um, so again, I think the branch chain amino acid and, and methionine restriction studies are are pretty clear that those animals are consuming more calories, more calories than that. Certainly, if you match the weight than mm -hmm. the ad libitum mice, and they're living longer. And what do we think is the uh, route or mechanism through which methionine exerts this effect? I don't know that, that that's still really being being worked out. There are lots of mechanisms that have been proposed. I suspect mTOR plays a role. Um, you know, people have thought about, so of course, uh, you know, methylation, methyl donors are important for a bunch of different epigenetic modifications. So there may be a role there going back to the epigenome mm -hmm. that we talked about. Methionine is the first amino acid in every protein. Yep. So there could be effects on protein synthesis. There's evidence linking methionine restriction to sulfur amino acid uh, biology, which has been implicated in, in aging. So I it's hard to know, and maybe it's not one thing. It's hard. And it's those hard all to know. sound like potentially just a substrate reduction problem, right? Like less sulfur cross bridging, 
less protein synthesis. Right. Well, uh, yeah. And, and again, you know, if you look back in the, the literature in the invertebrates, inhibition of, and inhibition of protein synthesis in some cases is enough to extend lifespan. And of course, mTOR is a primary regulator of protein synthesis. Yeah. So when you inhibit mTOR, you can also inhibit protein synthesis. So there's, that's part of the challenge here is this network is so interconnected that when you tweak one part of it, you have effects throughout the network and it's really hard to know which of those effects are causal. In so some, let's in talk some about cases. time course, right? Yeah. So when you consume a protein rich meal, um, do we have a sense of how long mTOR is being activated in response to that set of amino acids? I'm sure somebody does. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I mean, I think, again, almost certainly it's going to depend on um, what you eat in combination with the protein when you eat. Yeah, exactly. You know, like How I mean, active I, you I, are. I, I remember talking to David Sabatini about this through the lens of BCAA drinks. Yeah. So... If you're going to pound branched chain amino <laughs> acids during a workout yeah. because you want as much anabolic signal as possible, and this is a couple of years ago, so so maybe things have changed, but based on that work, I think Bobby Sutton had done the work in his lab, if I'm getting his name right. Was it Bobby Sutton was okay. uh, the guy who did that science paper that looked at the leucine sensor right. on mTOR? Right. The answer was it didn't stay on long at all. Yeah. Free amino acids were so short in their ability to turn on mTOR that unless you had an intravenous drip of this stuff, it was going to be very difficult. So much so that the idea of using BCAA analogs to treat sarcopenia was going to require drugs yeah. that could stay on yeah. much longer. Is that kind of within your frame of uh, thinking? I think so. And I think it also it also makes sense in a in a biological context, right? I mean, I mean cells and tissues you know, again, this gets back to the whole homeostasis concept, right? Cells and tissues have evolved to maintain metabolites and amino acids are, are metabolites, right? They're involved in many different metabolic reactions within certain levels. And there are all sorts of mechanisms to ensure that if, if a metabolite gets outside of that range, that we soak it up, we do something else with it, right? So yeah. I think it makes sense that you're probably not going to have, you know, a, a persistent, uh, increase in branch chain amino acids far outside the normal range. What I would say though, is that slightly elevated branch chain amino acids chronically can have big effects on the sort of downstream yeah. processes. And there are, there are some, you know, inborn diseases of childhood where you have elevated levels of branch chain amino acids. We know that there are consequences to even having, you know, somewhat modest increases in mTOR, hyperactivation of mTOR signaling chronically. Yep. So again, I think the context really matters. But yes, it's, it's my intuition that, that it's probably hard to get very large, persistent increases in mTOR simply from, you know, taking an, a branch chain amino acid supplement. Doesn't mean you might not, doesn't mean yeah. it couldn't have some effect on, you know, muscle building right after a workout or, um, but, but I suspect it's hard to have long-term, um, persistent effects on mTOR. I mean, the, 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 the anabolic data suggests it's not necessary. It's just, again, muscle protein synthesis window is open long yeah. enough that simply right. delivering a, a great source of whey protein in the hours after a workout yeah. seems sufficient yeah. to, the, to not restrict, uh, muscle potential growth. I think the other thing though, that is also important to appreciate, and this is true with, um, with rapamycin as well. I think a lot of people get, get confused about this is it's not only about how high mTOR gets turned on or how low it gets turned down. It's also about where that happens, right? And this is, again, you know, um, people for a long time thought that rapamycin would cause muscle loss, right? We don't see that. I mean, we just don't see it in mice and we don't see it in people. And I think it's probably because- and I'm guessing you're not seeing it in dogs. We have not seen anything to suggest that in dogs. Yeah, so I'm I'm guessing that has a, as as much to do with how much we're maybe more to do with where mTOR is being affected than than how much we're inhibiting mTOR when we're inhibiting mTOR. And so I think the same thing's probably. And do we know where the selectivity of rapamycin is? I mean, is it more selective in hepatocytes? Is it more selective in adipose tissue? Yeah. I mean, I I don't know of any good studies that have really carefully looked at this. There have been a few studies in mice that tried to look at, at um, tissue mTOR, mTOR signaling, you know, 
uh, in the context of rapamycin. <laughs> Again, this is- It's this a is, very technically challenging problem. Well, and this is what I was just going to say. It gets even more complicated because even in a mouse where you can con essentially control almost everything, right? Um, what the mice are eating and when they last ate has, if anything, as, as big, maybe bigger effect on mTOR signaling than rapamycin, right? So, so I, I don't, there have been, like I said, a couple studies that looked at this and I'm not sure, and they got different answers and I'm not sure who to believe because I don't think I The only was way wrong. I could imagine doing this is you have to be able to do subtractive studies where you have to be able to do it in the context of a whole bunch of different diets first get kind of a baseline that you yeah. then pull out of potentially what you're seeing. But yeah, boy, it's, it's I mean, just, it gets, it's gets it's complicated. It's complicated. And again, that's why I, you know, often will gravitate back towards what are the functional consequences we can actually measure, right? Sure. I get it. You think that treating a mouse with rapamycin is going to cause sarcopenia. Let's do the experiment and find out. The answer is no. It doesn't, right? So that tells us it's at least not as simple as we thought it was going to yeah. be. Um, we may, we certainly don't understand. Now, what all, about the flip side of that, of that is uh, more protein versus less protein activating rap, uh, mTOR in a way that is counterproductive? I think it can. Um, I think there, I think there are probably certain, certainly cases where it can. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody has really carefully done that study in mice. There, there was a study, it's a really interesting study by um, Steve Simpson and colleagues where, where they did this nutritional geometry work where they basically mm. looked at different compositions of carbohydrates, Steve fats, Simpson, he's proteins. in Australia? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, looked at, I don't remember how many diets, there's a whole range of diets, right? Different compositions of the three macronutrients. Tried to control for caloric intake, which is hard, as you can imagine, but I think they did a pretty good job. Um, and then asked, you know, what, what does it look like in terms of metabolism, energy expenditure, lifespan? So the lifespan studies, I think, are, are, are pretty clear that most of the diets where the mice lived the longest were towards the low end in protein. But there were some things that I think called into question exactly what was going on there because it wasn't the case that the, the, the mice that were energetic, the diets that were energetically lowest gave the longest lifespan, as you might expect from caloric restriction. And the diet that actually gave the absolute longest lifespan had like, I don't know, it was like a 40% protein in it, right? So, so the way I interpret that is that there are many ways to get to And how giving. calorie restricted was that? They, they, were, they were not calorically restricted at all. So you're These saying that a diet libidum. that was ad lib with 40% protein had the best outcome? The, the best absolute lifespan, yes. Again, how, how do we even reconcile well, this body this, of literature? Yeah, and this is sort of what I, where I was just going is I think that my view is there are probably multiple paths to longevity. Mm -hmm. And we really don't understand the, the interrelationships of these macronutrients in, in the diet with enough sophistication to to get beyond sort of broad general predictions. And again, you know, I sort of this is an area where I I really I believe, like I can't prove it, but I my intuition from of from the the data that I've seen and just my observations of people is that in humans, it's probably very this relationship between protein and health during aging is probably very different than it is in in mice. I think mice are able to tolerate a very low protein diet without, you know, some of the consequences that we yep. see in people. That's my intuition. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that that's true. But I mean, that's it's my, my intuition. intuition well uh, as well because clinically, what we see in what I call the death bars. The death bars is our internal nomenclature for how people die. We just constantly look at death bars and we double click and double click and double click all the way to try to tease out everything that is reducing lifespan and health span. And the problems that occur in humans when they are under muscled yeah. are insane. Yeah. And it ranges from the metabolic consequences of being under muscled. Our muscles are a sink for glucose. They are the single most important sink we have for glucose and our ability to tolerate glucose and maintain glucose homeostasis in the presence of larger, more metabolically healthy muscles is the difference between having diabetes and not having diabetes. Right. Furthermore, when you think about sarcopenia and when you think about osteoporosis, which Again, I just don't think we're talking about how these things impact animals. Like we don't study any animal, including primates, in a setting where sarcopenia and osteoporosis are problematic. And yet I would ask anyone to consider the entire 
population that they know over the age of 75. Yeah. And I would ask you, take every person that is alive today that's over 75 and tell me how many of them are not suffering at least some consequence of one or both of those phenomenon. And if somebody did that analysis, I would be shocked if we didn't find at least 80% of people over the age of 75 are experiencing this. And if you look at the activity, just monitor the activity level of people over the, at, once they hit 75, they fall off a cliff. So muscle mass dramatically plummets, activity levels dramatically plummet. It, difficult to say which one's feeding which. Yeah. But there's no question that something is happening to our species at about the age of 75 right. that is a structural problem. And none of this other stuff matters if that sucks, right? Like, right. I don't care if I live to 100 <laughs> and don't have cancer if I'm an invalid for the last 25 yeah. years and I can't play with my grandkids and throw a ball. Like, it just, for me personally, I'm not saying that's a that's not a view that everyone should take in the world. I'm just telling you that's my view. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I mean, I think that's absolutely correct. I guess the question, and I think this is still where some of the confusion comes from, is... Um, how important is dietary protein in that maintenance of muscle or loss of muscle in people who are going to go, you know, the, the wrong direction? And I think the data is that it is quite important. I mean, when you, there are lots of studies that have compared, you know, the RDA versus, you know, kind of the, the double RDA standard, yeah. and it's a significant difference. Yeah. Um, protein makes a very big difference, you know, following obviously, um, the training that that is necessary to stimulate muscle protein right. synthesis. So, so I think those have to be coupled to absolutely. some extent. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I believe there are data, and I hate when I have to say this because I just I'm going to say something and it's going to be wrong, and 20 people are going <laughs> to okay, respond. Okay, I do it all the time. Uh, sorry, so just in anticipation <laughs> of the fact that that there are data that I've read and I I don't have the memory <laughs> I once had. Um, I believe there are data that show just the protein difference alone can make some difference. Yeah but it's not nearly the difference you get when you pair it with hypertrophy training. Yeah, that, that's, that's my recollection as well, right? Which, which brings you know, us to the interesting question then, why is it that there is a camp? And, and in my field, it's a pretty vocal camp in the aging field, right? That would argue that low protein is the best nutritional strategy for aging and health span in people. And, you know, this is, this gets back to the point I'm, I, I kind of started with, which is that you can find the answer you want for almost any question in this area that intersects at nutrition and aging. There will be a study, right, yep. that will fit your belief. So I think you really have to be careful, or I try at least to, to take a global view and, and, and try to, to understand what is, what is the totality of the data say, right? But there are epidemiological studies and, and one in, in the field that um, most people will point to when they go to humans and they talk about low protein. And it, it was this, um, the study that uh, uh, Walter Longo was, um, I think the senior author on and Morgan Levine was the first author on where they looked at um, protein consumption and uh, all-cause mortality uh, as a function of age in people. There were some, some studies in, I think they had some yeast studies in there as well, mm -hmm. maybe some cell culture studies, but they looked at that the, the take home message was that low protein is beneficial up to about 65 years of age. And then once you get above 65 years of age, um, it kind of flips and people who ate a higher protein diet have lower all cause mortality. I should be clear when I say beneficial, we're talking specifically about all cause mortality. Which at the end of the day is a very important metric. Sure, you want to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not the most important <laughs> metric necessarily. You could argue it's equally important to the yeah. health span metrics, but it matters. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a, okay. So let's make sure people understand what that means. That means below the age of 65, the epidemiologic data in this study suggested right. people eating less protein had lower mortality and all cause mortality. And above 65, you saw that reverse. That's right. Yeah. Now, did that paper make any attempt to quantify the net impact on mortality? Because the very misleading thing about an assessment like that is when you look at mortality adjusted by population, before the age of 65, it's relatively low. Above the age of 65, it goes up very non-linearly. Yeah. Um, so when we do our death bar analysis, it's like, you know, this is the mortality, this is the death per 100,000 people if you're 40, 
50, 60, 70, 80, yep. 90, like, you know what I mean? It just, yep. it becomes insane. Yes. So you could argue through that analysis that you're much better off with a high protein strategy, even if it's throughout life, because the absolute reduction in mortality would unquestionably be lower as a result of the benefit you would have later in life. So I would, um, I, I absolutely agree with, with conceptually with, with what you said, right? The, the impact of a change in mortality late in life is going to usually swamp the impact, certainly swamp the impact, the same impact on mortality yeah. early in life. I think the question here is what are the relative effects, That's right? right? Yep. And so, so they did try, they did model this a little bit and it, it is, um, in their model, which I, 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 I couldn't get the data for, like, I don't, I don't know, I can't, evaluate exactly yeah. what they did. But in their model, the, uh, the, the relative risk um, crossed somewhere, you know, in the 60s, right? In other words, you know, your, your total mortality benefit uh, was lower eating a high protein diet. I think it was starting somewhere in the 60s. And that actually surprised me because, I, because for exactly the reason you said, the relative impact of the high protein diet um, early in life would have to be an order of magnitude greater than the relative impact of the. So I'm sorry. Say what their finding was again at the age of. My, 60. I don't remember the exact okay. number. It's in the it's in the paper, right? Yep. So you can see the curves. You can see the curves cross. It was much later than I thought it would be, given that 65 was the point that they they kind of picked. I right? see. I see. Yeah. So yeah, I would yeah. have thought maybe in your 50s. So I actually tried to do my own modeling of this off of the data that I that I could find on you know relative risk for low and high protein. Again, where you what you define low, what you define high, you know, there. And you're trying to ask the question: When should you switch the diet? Or maybe more formally, at what age do the does the risk equal out? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. What's the crossover? Yeah, yeah. And what did you find? When so you did mine this? was closer to like fifty. Yep. Um, that that's that's the point where uh, once you get past fifty, there the benefit of a high protein diet on mortality seems to outweigh any detriment that you would get from starting So that's earlier. odd to me because whether it's 50 or 60, Matt, it's a benefit on mortality, which is really, I think, where more of the argument is. There can't be any benefit on health span. From low protein? You no, mean? from high protein. Early in life or late? Why? Why can't there be a benefit? Oh, on late in life, I'm saying. Why not? Well, I'm saying like if you're protein restricted late in life, I, I mean, I think but low protein has yeah. no benefit on yeah, health. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, un I mean, again, unless, I, I, so I would agree with you intuitively, but I also well, have sorry. To, I, I'll <laughs> exclude special cases. So I'm not talking about people who have renal insufficiency for yeah. whom they have to restrict. You know, I, yeah. yeah. Now, I agree with you conceptually. The only thing that makes me hesitate a little bit is I've just seen, like I was talking about the mouse rapamycin experiments, where everybody who knew anything about muscle said that if you gave a mouse rapamycin throughout life, it was going to get sarcopenia. And that just didn't happen. So no, but I'm saying we have clinical data yeah, that yeah. suggests that when 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 people over the age of 65 are protein deficient versus protein significant, there's a there's a there's right. a huge difference in muscle mass, which we know is going to be associated with frailty and right, right. poor outcomes. Yeah. I, I would I would yeah. totally agree with that. I mean, I think that that it's it's very likely to be true. I think what we don't again. I don't know. Do we have controlled studies where people were eating low protein and doing resistance training late in life? I mean, I, there are nuance here fair, that, that could fair. complicate yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but I think in general, you're, you're probably I right. think the other area where this gets very complicated is the, um, I don't want to say by necessity, but just by convention, we use IGF-1 as a biomarker for protein intake. Yeah. And uh, it's certainly associated with protein intake, but you want to tell people what IGF-1 is? you know, a little bit of background of, you know, where it comes from sure. and what it's a proxy for. Sure. So IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor one. Um, it's uh, a hormone that's in, in the growth hormone pathway. So when, so it's, you can think of it as a growth promoting hormone. Sort of, sort of part of this central pathway that um, promotes uh, growth in many, many different tissues. So if you have high growth hormone levels, you'll have high IGF-1 levels and that, and high mTOR, right? So this is a, this is a, a, a part of the mTOR pathway as well, upstream of mTOR. So um, the reason why people have been really interested in, in IGF-1 in the field of aging biology, it comes, you know, from studies, again, in the very simple laboratory uh, model systems. So um, the most famous and, and one of the first 
uh, genes that was shown to, to clearly from a mechanistic perspective affect aging is it comes from Cynthia Kenyon and even Tom Johnson a little bit before her, which is the insulin-like receptor in C. elegans called DAF2. And Cynthia published a classic paper showing that if you make a mutation in DAF2, it could double the lifespan of worms and they seem to be healthier about twice as long. And what that mutation does is it turns down signaling through this pathway. Now, it's a little bit more complicated in worms because it's called the insulin IGF-1-like signaling pathway. So it's not identical. And so there's one pathway in, in worms that kind of takes the place of both IGF-1 signaling and insulin signaling. But you can kind of think of them as equivalent. And then there are a whole bunch of studies in mice for mostly mutations in the growth hormone upstream signaling uh, upstream of IGF-1 that lead to increased lifespan. So there are, so this means GH does not activate the production of more IGF-1. That's right. So you have, you have through a variety you of mechanisms. You have high GH, low IGF-1 animals. Well, low GH signaling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they probably are high in Oftentimes IGF-1. Oftentimes it's yeah. the receptor that's, yeah. that's mutated. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so those animals tend to be very long lived. They are they rival caloric restriction in terms of the magnitude of lifespan extension, um, and there are several different yep. mutations in that pathway. Um, the the mutations in IGF one. I guess I should know this the the, the current state of that literature a little bit better. Um, it's complicated, and there have been some controversies in the field about the different mutations that directly affect IGF one itself and the effects on lifespan. So I'm not going to wade into that because I think it still hasn't been resolved, but there's no question that mutations that reduce growth hormone signaling in mice extend lifespan. Now, it's important to understand though, that with one exception, um, those studies are all cases where the animals are growth hormone signaling deficient through development. So they are very, very small animals. And then they have constitutively low levels of signaling through that pathway for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, there's one study that, that, that I think it used a monoclonal antibody to the IGF-1 receptor in mice. This is from near Barzillai and, yep. and uh, Hasi Cohen. Yeah, where they treated mice with this antibody late, late in, in life. life and yeah. they got you know a reasonably sized lifespan extension. I, I think it was, I don't know, 14, 15 percent median lifespan so was that also and that, that was an antibody that did not penetrate the cns if i recall i, think I, I remember so. near talking about this and saying you would get all the benefits of igf right. in the brain right. without the benefits of igf in the or without the potential harm of igf in the periphery right yeah and that's another complication right where the the effects of igf in the brain might be fundamental on for health span and cognitive function much might, might be fundamentally different than yeah. high igf1 in in the periphery um so that study i think is the best evidence in mice that you can get some benefit specifically from reducing igf1 signaling in middle age and this is such an important question i get asked all the time i have a lot of patients that are asking to be put on growth hormone yeah. And, and, you know, we just don't do it. Um, and, and the, the reason is I just am not comfortable with that. I don't see enough data in humans to suggest that it's necessarily safe. Um, conversely, I don't really see evidence to suggest it's not yeah. that this is sort of the weird thing with growth hormone. Like if you buy hook, line and sinker, the argument that more growth hormone equals more IGF equals more mor mortality, and you look at how much growth hormone is being used. I mean, it is hands down the most abused drug in sports. It's like it's first, yeah. second, third. Nobody's even within the zip code. Yeah. And this is going back 35, maybe 40 years, probably to the early 80s. Where are the bodies? Yeah. Like there need to be more bodies. So, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm stuck with like I don't see where the bodies are. <laughs> But at the same time, it's still a bit of a leap for me. And I don't have the luxury of rapamycin data where I can at least point to all of the humans who have taken rapamycin for 23 years. And we know what that looks like. Yeah. And then even though it's not for GIRO protection, and then all of the mechanistic stuff that is consistently pointing the right way. So, so you know, I'm, there's going to be some patient of mine listening to this saying, Peter, you almost talked me into taking growth hormone based on your discussion. And it's, it's like, no, I, 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 I can't, you know, and it's funny. I even took it for a week after my shoulder surgery. I had sort of, you know, looked at some literature using GH and anabolic steroids to help with recovery. And it could have been true, true and unrelated, but like I felt the worst I've ever felt hmm. after a week of growth hormone and nandrolone. 
And I was like, yeah, I'm done. I, I just <laughs> I, I abandoned yeah. it. Now, again, I think it was, I was, I happened to be sick as well. Um, but my blood pressure went up, my blood sugar went up. I felt like crap. I couldn't sleep. Again, a lot of confounding factors, shoulder surgery and a nasty virus. So it, again, it could all be irrelevant. But I think, I think the point you made is actually a, a really important one. So first of all, I, you know, obviously I've never <clears throat> given growth hormone to anyone. I've never taken growth hormone. My, you know, I'm not an expert in the human application of growth hormone, but I've certainly tried to follow that literature, you know, because based on the mouse studies, you would have predicted, right, that growth hormone therapy should, should, should be, be bad, the most toxic right? therapy you could give a human. Yeah, certainly should should cause increased risk for a bunch of different diseases, including cancer. Mostly for, cancer, for sure. yeah. Yeah. And and my understanding of the literature here is that, um, like you said, it's not clear that there are significant benefits, particularly for strength. I think I think there's some evidence that muscle mass may increase, but but strength doesn't. But it's also not clear that there's any real detriments, right? That there's any significant risk, which is a little bit surprising. Yeah, it, it is surprising. And I do have a couple of patients who have taken it. Uh, usually other doctors were prescribing it or, you know, they came in under the care of somebody else and they all seem to claim they feel infinitely yeah. better on it. Um, there may be something to that, right? It might be that in 20 years, we have enough data to say, you know what, by the time you're 60, you should just be on a slow amount of growth hormone for all of these reasons. Um, I'd love to see somebody do this study because again, it's, it's a very important question to be asked. Yeah. And I also think we have enough data su to suggest that such a study is not unethical, right? In other words, we don't have an abundance of data. In fact, we have a paucity of data suggesting it's harm that it would justify ethically doing a study like this. Um, so anyway, that's, yeah. that's sort of a hope I would have because I, I really find this to be one of the most com confusing questions in this space. Yeah, I, I agree. And again, I think, you know, this is sort of why I've, I personally have settled around the idea for now, at least that, um, that, that IGF one particularly is, is probably not that informative in people, particularly, you know, once you get past 50 years, 50 years is arbitrary, but that's kind of where I would, I would put the number. Um, obviously again, IGF one itself is complicated because you don't really know what that means in terms of IGF one signaling and downstream activity. But yeah, you know, important, a, I guess, for people to understand that just like testosterone is mostly bound to sex and binding globulin, yeah. there's only a small amount of testosterone that's free. It's the same with IGF-1. It has these IGFBPs or binding proteins that bind most of it. And therefore, total IGF is not really completely informative as to what's happening, even in terms of the quantity that's there for signaling, yeah. because it's not the yeah. unbound portion of it. So some people look at things like IGF to IGFBP ratio. The bigger that number is, in theory, the more IGF signaling you would have. But you know, this gets to now when you look at sort of the epidemiologic curves, which on the x-axis would show in, you know, deciles or quartiles or whatever buckets, IGF levels rising, and then on the y-axis would show you mortality. I've never seen one of those curves that just goes up. Yeah. Right. They're, sometimes they're U-shaped, sometimes they're downsloped, sometimes they're flat, and it depends on the indication. Yeah. But the story seems much more complicated than IGF is bad. I agree. And and again, I think, you know, going back to the the Levine paper that, that we were talking about, again, I think it's a it's an important paper. It's a it's a well done paper. You really have to recognize that um the population you're looking in might make a big difference as well, right? So we, you know, if you're talking about a population of people where 30% of them are obese, some high percentage have metabolic disease or, or diabetes, you know, having high IGF-1 in that context might be very different than somebody who is appropriate Insulin rate, sensitive, yeah. exercising, eating a high protein diet, right? And again, that those kinds of things don't typically come out in these epidemiological studies. The other thing I'll say is, you know, in kind of thinking about what we might talk about today, you know, I went and tried to look through the literature and see what other studies have shown, you know, that that same uh, relationship. And they're all over the place. You can find studies that really don't show any, for protein, con, protein consumption particularly, you can find studies epidemiological that really don't show any downside to eating a high protein diet in people. Um, so it's hard to, it's hard for me to draw too much confidence that high protein is significantly detrimental when you're younger than 50. 
And I, I feel pretty confident that a higher, at least certainly higher than the RDA uh, level of dietary protein intake when you're above 50 is beneficial, particularly if you're exercising. I mean, that's where I would be a little bit concerned. If you've got somebody who's yep. overweight, obese, diabetic, sedentary, so high calorie plus high protein could totally, be problematic. To totally agree. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think that's a, and by the way, I frankly think a lot of the epidemiology is tainted by that. Yeah. It's high protein in the context of yeah, high calorie. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that I think is, is also potentially interesting to think about in human are these, these people who have mutations in the growth hormone pathway, right? So this is now maybe more akin to these mouse models where they have low growth hormone signaling, you know, from development, even in utero, potentially, they go through their entire lives. There have been a, a couple of studies, again, Walter Longo, obviously prolific in this area, had a study on these, the, the little people of yeah. Ecuador, right? There have been several studies, but but the most- um, Little Ron dwarfs. So, yeah, that's know. right. The Little Ron syndrome. Yeah. The, uh, the most famous study is one that was published in science where they looked at, you know, lifespan and age-related health outcomes- um, in the, the people with low growth hormone signaling versus, you know, uh, controls in their same environment environment. Yeah. Um, it's sort of, it's a really fascinating study. Yeah, it is. So, so, I mean, I think that again, the, the, the interesting things are there's no difference in lifespan, but the, the, uh, people with low levels of growth hormone signaling, the, uh, reduction in cancer risk is, is profound. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was zero. <laughs> like, I think they did not have any, maybe there was, there was one person in their cohort who developed a cancer. I don't remember what it was and she was treated and then she, she lived the rest of her life, but none of them died from cancer. Um, and the rate of diabetes was lower in the, uh, the, the little people, but, but Ecuador, at least that part of Ecuador at that time had a very low diabetes rate to begin with something like 5%. So it's a little bit harder to say, but certainly sure. cancer, dramatic reduction in risk of cancer. So why didn't they yeah, why did, live yeah, longer? Exactly. And it's a little bit ambiguous. They don't really say, but you know, they say that there is a higher, much higher rate of alcoholism, um, uh, liver failure and accidents. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, this gets back to sort of what I was, I've, I've alluded to in passing a couple of times, which is the social and psychological consequences in humans that are just different than we have in mice, right? Yep. The, the growth hormone deficient mice aren't going to be subject. Well, they might be probably not subject to the same social pressures yep. that somebody, you know, has very low growth horm hormone signaling in people is subjected to, which may contribute to other, other things later on, like alcoholism. So anyways, fascinating though, um, biology, which does, it, which is consistent with the idea, I think that you can impact at least a subset of age related biology by being constitutively low in growth hormone through your entire life. You know, what would happen if you did that in bursts, you know, like post-developmentally just after puberty, say from your twenties and thirties, who knows, right? We don't have any, there are no naturally occurring examples of that. I don't, or very few yeah. that we could look at and actually evaluate. By the way, do we, um, do we have examples? Is there enough data to look at, um, people with acromegaly during different periods of their life to see if that's had the exact, have, do we seen a higher incidence of cancer? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, those, those populations would be relatively small, but yeah, yeah. May, maybe, maybe it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I imagine somebody's looked at that, the incidence of cancer yeah. in people with acrom adult onset acromegaly right. or something to that effect. Right. Um, the other thing I would say on the IGF thing before we leave that is, uh, the interplay with insulin. Yeah. And so, you know, high insulin, high IGF, low insulin, low IGF, high, low insulin, high IGF. I mean, these are very different physiologic Absolutely. states. Yeah. It's very difficult to think that we're teasing those out when we look at broad swaths. Yeah. And again, I think this just comes back to the fact that these, especially these epidemiological studies are a mixture of, you know, normal people typically, yeah. right? And so the lifestyles that are, that most people are living, right, are what gets weighted in those types of analyses. And that may be very different, you know, as, as, you're, as we talked about, if you are normal weight, high protein, maybe high calorie, because you're extremely active, right? Yep. Um, then if you're overweight, 
sedentary and eating a high, high calorie diet. I, I really think that's underappreciated and, and, you know, probably really, really important. Um, and, you know, and thinking about the cancer risk again, I, this is going to be some pure speculation on my part though. Right. But, but there's no question. I don't think that high growth hormone signaling and high IGF one signaling, everything else being equal in a person leads to a higher risk of developing cancer. You don't. I, I, I don't. I don't. I think that's true. Oh, you do think that's yeah, yeah. true. Okay. I, yeah, I, yeah. I believe that that's true. Everything else being equal, of course, everything isn't going to be equal. Yeah. But if we just look at that, though, that one variable signaling through that pathway, higher signaling, higher risk of cancer. So then, if it's the case, which I think you could, you know, we could we could make an argument that that doesn't seem to be the case, at least in certain populations of people that, that high growth hormone signaling or treating with growth hormone dramatically increases the cancer incidence. So why is that? Or in people who are- And, and by the way, we should also differentiate between high causes it versus low removes it. In other sure. words, just because we have a genetic example of where not having it uh, creates a, a deficiency of cancer, right. it doesn't mean- so, so going from sort of 100 to 30 decreases cancer doesn't mean going from 100 to 30 increases cancer, 100 to 130 increases cancer. That's right. No, that's, that's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. We just, I mean, we don't know. Yeah. We could. But. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, I think the word you use there is interesting because you said removes it. And I, I know this isn't what you, what you meant, but this is, this is, I think, something that is also important to appreciate. So to go from, you know, pre-initiation of cancer, right, to cancer, to metastasis, to you know, somebody dying from it. There's a, there's steps that have to happen there, right? And there are different defense mechanisms that yeah. act at, at each of those steps. My guess is growth hormone and IGF one is primarily acting at the very early steps, right? Where we know that if you if you promote cell division, that that is a sort of a permissive early environment for mutations to happen and, and cancers to to get a foothold. But in, in, in most cases, it seems to be the case that those early cancers are detected and wiped out by our immune system, right? And, yeah. and one of the reasons why I think a lot of cancers become more prevalent as we get older is because the, immune, the function of the immune system to detect and clear those cancers declines. Um, there's obviously other stuff going on, accumulation of senescent cells, which contributes to this process. But if you are, say, I shouldn't even say this because I, I, I bother people about the biological clocks. Let's just say though, theoretically, you know, you're a 60 year old person, but biologically, because you are exercising, eating a appropriate diet, um, biologically, you're 40 years old, at least your immune system is functioning like a 40 year old. You might have a little bit higher IGF-1. You might have a little bit higher of that early cancer risk, but you have a much lower total risk of developing cancer because your immune system has a much better chance of catching it and getting rid of it. And those are things we don't yeah, even, that's we so don't even think about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Matt, I don't know that we settled anything today, <laughs> did we? I, I, it's, it's pretty safe to say there we've, we've probably for the listener created more questions than answers. Uh, no, I'm sure we've done some good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, again, it's a, it's a complicated question. And, you know, we, we actually did not dive into the genetic interaction with caloric restriction. So, I mean, I think the take home there is that even in mice where we can control everything else, if you look across genotypes, you get different results from the same diet and the effect of caloric restriction on lifespan. So, you know, I, maybe we can't answer the, the, the big detailed questions. I, I guess the take homes I, I would have are Again, we've learned a ton from these nutritional studies um, in laboratory animals about the biological mechanisms. We've learned a lot about which proteins are and, and pathways are important. And that has led us to things like rapamycin, right? Which might be a more effective uh, intervention in humans. So they have value for that. Um, and I think, you know, the other take home that we've talked about is you don't have to worry about every little detail, right? I think, I think again, most people can get a big chunk of the way there by eating a relatively healthy diet. Don't worry so much about how much protein, how much carbs, how much fat. Eat good foods, right? Don't overeat and be active, right? Exercise. And, and I, I do worry a little bit that we, you know, society does this, but, but scientists do it sometimes too. When we start, you know, really getting into the weeds and making recommendations to people that we overthink things a little bit, right. And 
give people anxiety about worrying, <laughs> worrying about, am I eating a low enough protein diet or am I on, you know, am I, am I still or, in ketosis? Or what, what I got to do my breath Yeah, what should every, my fasting window be? Yeah, should right. it be 16 hours versus yeah. 18 hours? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the questions are out there, to what extent do any of these things have big benefits? I think you can get most of the benefits without worrying about a lot of that. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, glad we finally got to do one of these in person. Yeah, it's maybe, been a pleasure. Maybe, maybe the yeah. next one should be in person as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you.